welcome to all of you to this beautiful venue, which is the headquarter of the uh, French Communist Party, which was designed by uh, Nemea. What a beautiful uh, venue for our series of conference. And this morning, we are going to talk about historic periods in which uh, cut stone was used in large quantities. It will also allow us to talk about concrete and its presence in the architecture of the 20th and 21st century. We wanted to address this topic very early on so that in April, we can talk about the use of stone in modern buildings, which will be the topic of our conference next month. We are now having Eloise Letelier Taifer, who is going to give us a conference on construction techniques in Roman times. And in this uh, conference, we'll talk about the importance and high quality of mortars developed in the Roman world. Eloise Taifer is a professor in art history and archaeology at the Institute of Art and Archaeology at Paris University. So, Eloise, delighted to have you and um, looking forward to listening to you. Well, Hello, everyone, and thank, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, academy for inviting me to come and talk to you about Roman antiquity in this uh, large overview about stone as a building material. I will make a very short introduction to the use of stone in construction by using contribution from archaeology and history to envisage its multiple facets, whether technical but also symbolic. If we think about the masterpieces of Roman architecture uh, with uh, the Pantheon and its uh, cupola of uh, 43 meters in diameter, the largest ever built before the, without any support before the building of Knit in 1958. If you look at this, you see that uh, brick seems to be predominating and we will then talk about the columns. But the striking effects in the ruins of the herbs uh, are linked to the uh, varied colors of uh, earthenware under the uh, rays of the sun. And the most striking example are the uh, baths of Caracalla, which were built, built in the south of Rome. This is where you have uh, many walls that survived from the Frigidarium and Calidarium. Those of you who had the opportunity of uh, t making a trip to Rome probably remember the impressive sub-constructions uh, of the uh, palaces of the emperors. So should we consider Rome as a city of bricks, which is uh, taking the topic of my presentation in the reverse direction, because I'm quite aware that I'm supposed to talk to you about stones. But talking about uh, this um, it means that we nuance the approach to Rome, a small city that uh, progressively became the capital of one of the largest empires in, an, in, an, in the an, antique times, but it's also talking about what we call the Roman times. All these cities and provinces that were progressively submitted to Rome's domination and which were managed by Rome according to various modalities. So it's in Roman architecture outside the cities that we can see the use of bricks which allow building any type of building. And in Pompeii, the small city in the, in the south of Italy, we can see, thanks to the uh, extraordinary conservation of the city, we can witness life in the Roman times before the first social war in the first century. 
before Christ, and with the building of the first model of Basilica, a large covered uh, arcade opening up to the forum. We can see that the columns supporting the roof of this basilica are formed not from large stones piled up on top of one of another, but from bricks which were molded specifically in order to uh, mimic the uh, grooves in these columns which were then covered to imitate marble. So even columns back in the days could be made not in stone but in bricks. The Austria colony, which was created at the beginning of the Republic to ensure the control that Rome would um, control its uh, river, and which then became one of the largest uh, harbor in the Roman Empire, is a city where brick seems to predominate. And this is even strengthened by the magnitude of restorations that uh, the, the buildings underwent in the 19th century. And this part of decor that comes from the facade of the theater shows that their mastery of bricks allowed them to build structures of the building, but also the architectural decor in its entirety. And so on and so forth, depending on places and periods and you can see the presence of bricks in Roman architecture throughout the empire uh, and in all provinces as they became uh, conquered. But today, let's uh, talk about the use of bricks, very often present in uh, Roman architecture, as combined with stone. Here is an example of the Gallian Palace in Bordeaux, which was built in the north of the city during the first half of uh, the second century. You see the main gates showing a facade, a facade with two levels of arches and including a structure with uh, stones and then bricks that give this uh, aspect to this facade, which was most probably covered uh, with uh, stucco to imitate marble. And inside, most of the structure was made in wood. So if stone is present in Roman construction, it is not the only material that's being used, and it, uh, pre it exists along with other important materials. And one example that could be uh, mentioned in Paris are the uh, bath of Cluny, built in the second century before, uh, after Christ, which uh, you can visit if you take a visit of the Cluny Museum here in Paris. These are the best uh, preserved uh, elements of Roman architectures in Paris. And you see that there are mixed structures made of stone and bricks which you can see alongside the Boulevard Saint-Michel in Paris. So in Rome, in Italy, and in the conquered provinces, Roman constructions are easily uh, recognized because of their brick masonry and brick and stone masonry, which are one of the important landmarks of Roman architecture. This opposition between brick and stone comes from Emperor Augustus himself, who, according to historians, said himself that he had received a Rome made of bricks and had given, given it back made of marble. So if we take it to the letter, we could wonder whether uh, Rome was a city of bricks uh, before Augustus, or if it was so uh, in the reigns of emperors that came after him, as suggested by the various architectural remains that we have. But instead of giving us uh, archaeological information, this quote encourages us to see the symbolic value of brick and in mirror to that 
the symbolic value of stone in Roman construction. Rome was not a city of brick when Caesar died or at the beginning of Augustus' reign. Of course, the oldest temples in Rome were influenced by Greek architecture and included a lot of brick and wood. Yes, there were constructions made in a brick in Rome, especially for housings. But we also know that the oldest monuments in Rome, such as uh, the uh, uh, Capitoline uh, Temple, were made of stone of Tuffa, uh, of Tufa, and we know that marble started uh, being much used in Rome as early as the 2nd century after Christ when magistrates and in Rome started the building temples to commemorate their, their victories. So Augustus didn't find a Rome made of brick that he would have turned into a Rome made of, of marble. What he found was an old Rome, non-sustainable Rome, which he turned into a modern, renovated uh, city that was supposed to be able to be sustained over centuries. And this is what the historian uh, Dion said uh, one century later. So here, in the quote stone, is a symbol for the robustness of the empire. So, no, we don't necessarily associate Roman construction and stone, stone being more relevant for Greek architecture, but it's mostly bricks that uh, uh, are related to Roman architectures. However, we need to nuance this approach, and the two materials cannot systematically be opposed. By focusing on stones, we're going to try and look at the practices and know-how of architects and masons in the Roman Empire when they uh, built stone buildings at the service of any type of architectural projects. And we have lots of ruins around the Mediterranean that demonstrate their excellent structural qualities. We will therefore look at the use of stone in uh, Roman architecture, and we will look at the uh, methodological approaches used by history of architecture and archaeology. And we will also look look at the material and symbolic value uh, of this material in the Roman world. <laughs> in order to give you this overview with regards to the use of stone in the Roman world, I uh, use the works of researchers who vastly explored this topic and published uh, uh, very important articles, starting with uh, Jean-Pierre Adam, who authored the Roman construction, which is the reference Uh, for stone cutting, uh, Jean-Claude Bessac has worked on te techniques and tools used by stone cutters in Roman times. And as for me, I was trained and educated at university to have a, a good approach to this uh, Roman construction techniques. Last warning, I will focus on the western part of the Roman Empire because that's my field of expertise and I had to make choices. But the eastern part of uh, the empire, Greece, uh, also has a specificity that uh, should deserve specific approach. So let's uh, take a look at the use of stone in Roman constructions. When thinking about construction stone, we think first about cut stones and their use in large structures made of blocks and not small stones, uh, implanted regularly and um, with no mortar to join the stones. We know that the Greeks were excellent in this field, but this was also a technique that 
existed in Roman uh, construction. And the uh, Jupiter Temple in Rome uh, that was completed at the end of the royal period and that was inaugurated uh, when Rome transitioned to the Republic, this was a major stone structure. The podium is intact today. It's a very imposing foundation made of tufa called Capellaccio tufa, which was quarried in Rome, in the very city of Rome, and used for construction. These structures uh, were still very much present during the Republic and during the Servius Julius era. Everything and what remains dates back to the fourth century after, after Christ. There again, you have um, uh, large structures made of tufa with a shift from local grey capellaccio. Uh, tufa to a uh, grotto scura uh, tufa, which came from uh, remote quarries that uh, were conquered by uh, the Roman Empire. So the color of the stone allows us to give us uh, a indication of the date when they were built. As provinces were conquered, they adopted the polygonal uh, structures, more specifically in their defensive architecture, as for walls, for instance. This is an example with the walls of the uh, Cosa uh, walls, a colony created by Rome to control the Tyrrhenian coast close to the former city of uh, Volci. So obviously, the Romans had uh, perfect mastery of stone structures and foundations since the beginning. So we see that uh, structures and foundations were very important, but also other structures like columns and pillars, which were the uh, translation into stone of a more traditional wooden architecture. Even though we've seen that columns could be built in bricks, these columns are most of the time uh, constructed with uh, stones, with the various large stones which are piled up on top of one of another and fixed to one another through uh, pins. This is an example of a tufa uh, column which is grooved and covered with stucco to imitate um, marble in the Apollo temple in Pompeii. But tufa does not allow a extracting long, uh, long stones like marble wood, so they have uh, extracted various blocks. Here are examples of uh, monoblocks. The most uh, famous example is that of the Pantheon in Rome, but it can be uh, shown alongside other uh, temples, like the Venus Temple in uh, in Rome, or the Antonine and Faustina Temple here on the Roman Forum, with this, uh, these columns in green marble, which are erected at a height of more than 14 meters. So 12 meters for the drums, which for the Pantheon each weigh about 50 tons. So here we have a, an incredible mastery of the material, of its trans transportation, which does not just meet uh, aesthetic criteria, but also shows the art of the architects and the prestige of these imperial projects that were commissioned by the emperors themselves. We've seen the use of stone in these uh, structures, in foundations, in columns, but stone was also very much used in architectural decors in everything that was carved in stone. 
bases, capitals, all of these elements which complemented uh, the rhythm of those freestanding structures. Here's an example of two orders which are uh, superimposed, Ionic and Doric. This is the facade of the Marcellus Theatre uh, built by Augustus. This is an important architectural um, monument. We see the development of the cutting of these um, <coughs> decoration elements. We can study the different blocks. Uh, uh, incomplete blocks which give essential information on this uh, uh, decorative uh, elements. We also have sketches, drawings, uh, which are engraved on walls or facings of monuments during the work sites, which were a way to specify these decoration elements and which were used as uh, references uh, for architects. There's a study of Jeanne Capelle on the theatre of Millet, or the mausoleum of Augustus in Rome. All of these elements, in particular for large structures, uh, stone cutting techniques, uh, the setting up of uh, blocks, this has been studied for uh, tens, hundreds of years uh, uh, to look at the, the history of monumental architecture. You have uh, the uh, surveys, the, the, the measuring, uh, measurings of these um, structures. When you work on these large structures, in particular from an archaeological point of view, you look at the traces on blocks. So, so we can see the ancient state of uh, the building, how it was built and implemented as well. We see the traces of cutting of tools on these buildings and we can recreate the way they were produced with different experiments which were conducted. We have a few recent examples of those. We also analyze the traces, tracks of uh, installation, implementation of these large blocks. This was one of the major challenges uh, uh, of these structures for the thrust and the load bearing for these buildings to be able to withstand, withstand uh, the weight. And we have uh, also uh, different holes, uh, lifting and rigging uh, setups uh, that can be uh, analyzed, uh, uh, the way the different blocks were uh, um, attached to one another with studs and different uh, devices. We can also analyze different documents on lifting equipment that was used. Here you have a wheel a device, a wheel-driven device. You have a man uh, uh, making this wheel turn in order to uh, raise a column. And Jean-Pierre Adam worked on uh, the recreation of these uh, devices uh, for Roman antiquity. So you can see that stone is very much present in those large structures. But in Roman construction, you have the development of masonry with uh, um, lime and uh, aggregates. Uh, small uh, modules mixed with lime to create a cement or a type of concrete, um, which is called caimentisium, caimenta. This was mixed with mortar, and this gave uh, uh, the opus caimenticu, which is the masonry technique in Roman times, which uh, gave birth to our own cement. These techniques were developed throughout the empire and allowed to create molded uh, structures or with facings, uh, facings with large, which are large, uh, small-scale structures with different materials such as stone and wood. Here we have uh, um, images from ACO. Uh, it, uh, it is an international project with a website. You can uh, get more information on all of these issues. A lot of uh, remains uh, have been preserved, which showed 
the longevity of this Roman material. Here we have the example of a funeral building uh, along the Via Appia in Rome. We've kept the core of this structure. Uh, some of the facings were recovered uh, at the end of antiquity. You have mortars and aggregates here uh, layered. You see the limit between the, these different types of materials. You have uh, uh, a, a, a thin a layer of lime, uh, which is very typical of Roman construction. You might know the pyramid of Uta, which is very typical and has this mortar core. So the stone is very much present in the making of this mortar for the aggregates, because a mortar uh, uh, uses different types of stones and rubble, which can be mixed with terracotta. Stone is also necessary for the mortar itself. Uh, the mortar of Roman masonry is made from water, lime coming from the baking of carbonated rock, and also an aggregate, sand uh, generally. Uh, the Romans used to select the sand, uh, a specific uh, volcanic powder in particular, uh, with a lot of silica, which explains the typical properties of a Roman concrete or a mortar uh, for uh, uh, subaquatic constructions. Uh, it has very strong watertight uh, um, qualities. This is an image from a recent project to recreate a lime kiln. The stone is present in the composition of this lime mortar. You need lime scale to uh, use this uh, type of lime, which is heated at 900 degrees. Arnaud Kukula in France is one of the Kutula, one of the research which, have, which has uh, studied, sorry, who has studied um, the composition of these mortars and the various techniques to make this uh, lime mortar. So to develop this masonry technique, or this masonry technique has radically changed modes of building, constructing, uh, the standardization uh, uh, of uh, structures and materials, and uh, also the workers didn't need uh, to be as skilled as for um, stones. Stone cutting. So this was a source of innovation in the Roman world. This allowed the, the creation of lighter structures, which could be multiplied, superimposed, to bear the stance of large uh, performance buildings. Here's the amphitheater of Pompeii, which was built under the Republic. This is the most ancient type of uh, amphitheater. The city was transformed into a colony by the Romans, the amphitheater uh, was uh, used for uh, combat of gladiators. It was made thanks to masonry with facings in small uh, structures with lava, uh, uh, rubble. And you also have a tough and lime scale. Uh, if you look at the structure, this is a witness of architectural experimentation, very innovative uh, techniques we used. In the corridor uh, leading to the arena, you see the wood coffer. Uh, and you see the mortar moldings. As for the slabs, uh, you have a different type of stone, a hard uh, uh, basalt uh, used for the floor because you had uh, horse uh, uh, carriages going into the arena. 
tools, uh, uh, the ashlars were often despoiled, used for other um, types of uh, uh, monuments. You also have parts of those buildings which could not be used. Here we can see uh, the core of the masonry as evidence in the mausoleum of Augustus. So here you have aggregates uh, in facings. You see the stone in large structures, smaller structures with many techniques. This is uh, what is studied by the archaeology of the built environment. They try to compare in a, in, in a typological manner, these different, different structures made of very different materials associated in a different way with coin stiffness and so on. This type of analysis can be developed at the scale of a monument. Here on the right, you see an example of the study of the different types of uh, facings of the... This is the example of the Villa of Diomedes in Pompeii. Uh, Ellen de Salles uh, published a study on uh, this uh, villa recently. So here you see the different ways that walls were built. Uh, especially during the empire, as evidenced by uh, the, the Accor, this international project. So you have different techniques of construction uh, for one single monument. We see the transformations, uh, as, uh, we, as was evidenced with the Villa of Diomedes. You also have the archaeology of construction to look at the work site itself and its momentum, why these choices were made. There were different teams working in, a, in the same work site. So this is a way to look at this differently in terms of research. Uh, if we uh, talk uh, talking about masonry, we have stone blocks uh, with mortar and small-scale uh, structures for openings, uh, the thresholds of doors, door frames. Uh, these stones uh, are very much telling. We see the different uh, arrangement of these uh, parts of these pieces and this uh, um, uh, they give a lot of evidence as to the history of these monuments. Again, these are examples from the Villa Diomedes in Pompeii. We talked about the decoration, the decor with different architect, uh, architectural orders and, and the use of stone. But stone is also present in other parts of the decoration, uh, the finishes of monuments, internal decoration. Um, in the, the floors, for example, on the floors, we have polychromous marble in a specific um, technique, opus sectile, which is a, a way to work the marble, the floors. You have polychrome uh, marbles, which is cut in geometrical shapes, uh, and you have a layer um, of a mortar to have glistening, this glistening effect on the floors. You have the Clos de la Lombarde in the city of Narbonne, which has an example of uh, uh, this uh, technique, uh, a, a, a magnificent uh, flooring with these colored marbles coming from all parts of the Mediterranean. These were masterpieces, uh, technical masterpieces. Uh, you have the mosaic, uh, mosaics, mosaic work, which were used uh, on the floor. These were made of uh, cubic uh, pieces of tiles assembled in a layer of mortar to shape geometrical uh, uh, patterns, sometimes figurative patterns. Here you have the example, examples from the baths of Caracas. 
Caroline Rome, which I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. So you have terracotta in, this, in these buildings, but also stone uh, is used a lot in the decoration. Uh, we see the traces of uh, uh, these techniques uh, on the walls, the wall veneer. Uh, sometimes these walls were painted, or you could have a stone veneer, a marble veneer, sometimes colored, and often they were reused because uh, these are precious materials. And in the structures, you see, you can see holes, the different fixtures that were used, uh, metal studs or fixtures, or also you can see the different layers of mortar uh, used to assemble these pieces. We also see a stone in urban furniture, uh, this exceptional piece. Uh, this is a basin uh, uh, from uh, um, the square of Farnese. So you have stone used uh, in different ways from the core of the buildings as well as in the decorative uh, elements. Whether we're speaking of masonry, uh, facings, whether it is associated with bricks, and so on. To conclude, even when stone was not present in the decoration itself, and uh, maybe in more humble uh, um, a context, it could be used for. Uh, um, it could be imitated, so it was symbo symbolically present in painted uh, decorations and painted coatings. So these were painted uh, decorations used in Pompeii, uh, uh, for instance. Uh, so this is the, uh, the first style, uh, this is called the first style of Pompeii. You see it in the Samnite uh, uh, house in Herculaneum. It is painted uh, with uh, glistening colors, it imitates polychromous stone, and it imitates large uh, uh, stone structures. This is a type of decoration which is very ancient and which was kept in some uh, old dwellings uh, to show uh, the skills that were used uh, in ancient times. Then in painted decors, uh, you also have the second style. We can find them in Bosco Reale, in Pompeii, on the uh, hills, on the slopes of, of the Vesuv. Here you have the villa, the, sorry, the villa of Fanius Sinista, again in Bosco Reale. And here you have a cubicolo, which is a bedroom, and which has been pieced together in the Met in New York. Here you have another example, not with stucco, but it's very, uh, uh, it, it, ha, it is a trompe with a different use of color. And again here, we see different types of rocks uh, 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 that are being imitated. Uh, so stone is very much present, even though it is uh, not. For all these usages, Romans select materials locally. Uh, sometimes it is uh, sourced uh, uh, further away. Uh, they use stones for its uh, aesthetic and mechanical properties. From a mechanical point of view, in Roman times, we look at the hardness of uh, ashlars. You have uh, different types of uh, hardness. Also, the resistance to climate conditions, weather conditions, and other mechanical properties of stones. We are also interested in aesthetic, the aesthetic properties, color, the ability to polish the surface of some stones for decoration purposes. We also have texts showing that Romans were selecting materials in a very meticulous manner. For instance, the treaty of, uh, uh, of uh, an architectural uh, treaty uh, from uh, Vitruvius, uh, written um, in the first century BC. In its second book, he presents the, the materials, construction materials, so uh, um, raw earth, uh, uh, sand, but also stone, insisting on its quality and the different usages. 
there are other uh, uh, similar approaches looking, uh, showing that there was a selection of materials. We know ancient quarries, uh, um, uh, open sky uh, quarries in particular. You can see the, the book of Jean-Pierre Adam uh, on the subject. Also uh, related to quarries, this is an image from a quarry discovered during an archaeological project in Marseille on the site of La Corderie. This is a uh, Greek uh, quarry uh, in, from Marseille. It was also used in Roman times. And we can see how blocks were extracted uh, in rectangular shapes uh, to be used then in work sites. They could be cut, rough hewn uh, locally, and then transported to the work sites. Uh, in these quarries, we see traces of tools, the different extraction methods uh, which were used, which show how stone was uh, uh, used and worked on from the very beginning. For small stones or rubble, we use local, they used local materials, but also there were also imported uh, materials for the decoration in particular, but uh, um, uh, materials were locally sourced for large structures. Here you have an example of the Temple of Mercure <coughs> from the Puy Dome, at the top of the Puy Dome, using the local volcanic stone. Uh, which uh, facilitates uh, the, the work site, uh, the work on the work site. But there are many other examples. Romans uh, uh, give precedence to local materials. Sometimes uh, they are very varied. Uh, in Rome, you have different types of turf, travertine, which is a, a typical rock used in Roman architecture, and white marble coming from Italy, used in Carrara uh, from uh, uh, the beginning of the empire, from Augustus. There's the example of Pompeii, which is a sort of laboratory with many examples. You have a wide variety of available materials according to the volcanic uh, nature of the region, of course, with magmatic uh, effusive rocks, either lava or basalt, uh, uh, as uh, uh, described by the Romans, uh, for the streets, uh, for the thresholds, uh, also for theatres. Uh, in Pompeii, locally, or very close by, we could find grey tufa from Nocera, which is a neighboring city of Pompeii, using for large blocks, for the um, walls, the city walls. Recent research has shown uh, the craftsmanship uh, uh, which was uh, applied on the stones to shape uh, um, columns, for instance. Limestone is also very much present in Pompeii. It's called the Sarno limestone and was sourced locally. It's found uh, for large structures in the wall, but also as rubbles in other constructions. We also have uh, volcano stones, which are much lighter. Uh, and here the question of density with regards to volume when you talk about stone materials is important and they were using pruma which is a, a stone with a large alveola it's very light it's colored in red or, or burgundy and as it's very light it's very often used in um, in decoration, in, de in decors. So you see that these stones are used by masons and architects in a highly optimized way. Then Romans felt free to import stones from uh, further away using their military domination all over the Mediterranean. 
and they therefore had access to large quarries of stones and, and high-value stones and marbles that were then uh, controlled by the Roman authority because uh, stones were a very important raw material indeed. The context of the Roman conquest also takes part at the times where the economy was booming, meaning that there was high demand for uh, good quality decor, which encouraged the exports of marble, which also was booming in Roman times. And stones were transported by sea using uh, uh, vessels that were adapted for the transportation of very heavy material. And marine archaeology has uh, identified various uh, shipwrecks loaded with uh, marble blocks, capital um, columns that were ready to be transported or shipped to Rome or to other provinces in the empire and then implemented in construction. Some harbors were the uh, hubs for this trade as the Ostia harbor where marble plates were uh, discovered awaiting transportation to Rome. And here, is, here are four columns ready to be cut and implemented on a work site. The map you can see here comes from the Ostia archaeological site showing that all around the Mediterranean you had showing the provenance of marbles that were found in Ostia. And you can see that they come from all over the Mediterranean basin. Uh, there are quarries everywhere around the Mediterranean, including in Egypt and in Northern Africa and in many other localities. And by the way, I'd like, you to ref I'd like to refer you to a recent article published by Emmanuel Roussin that's dedicated to uh, trade routes in the Roman Empire. So you have this um, resource, either local or coming from uh, further away, that requires special expertise. And this is where we see the development of uh, uh, various trades in the field of construction. We can attest to that thanks to epigraphic or uh, literary uh, text sources. And I have particular affection for this teller in the Border Museum. It shows a stone cutter cutting himself the stone of his um, of his uh, grave. Uh, so there are many categories of tradesmen who specialize in the uh, stone trade. You have uh, stone cutters in quarries, you have uh, stone cutters for large blocks, you have specialists in mosaics, uh, and for all this we have uh, evidence provided to us in various texts. As for the cutting of architectural decors, we know that some workshops were traveling from site to site and that some Roman workshops could also move to other provinces to, to share their techniques. And this is what we are currently studying when we study the dissemination of models throughout the empire. We we'll also know about uh, craftsmen who specialized in masonry, whom we call masons, called structures in a Roman, meaning structure, those who build a structure. So they were in charge of cutting uh, uh, rubbles, but also uh, of uh, preparing the mortar. And here you can see a mason with his uh, tools, you have the amphora, which is used for transportation of uh, lime. You have a hammer, you have scissors, all the tools showing that these are multipurpose tra uh, uh, tradesmen who are capable of working on different aspects of these constructions. 
the usual vision for the development of these construction is that it spread in Italy, uh, encouraged by the influx of uh, slaves from conquered provinces and thanks to a standardized production mode with simple tasks that require no specific expertise. And the development of this uh, architecture is also, also allowed uh, to cut down the cost of these constructions. But studies that were conducted using a, a new perspective over these uh, constructions, looking, for instance, at the taking into account of uh, seismic risk when implementing uh, various materials demonstrate that there is a very special know-how that these uh, Roman uh, tradesmen have. They have empirical know-how that they accumulated over time and which allowed them to embrace new techniques and which they adapted uh, depending on the context. Uh, so that shows that these uh, craftsmen are specialized indeed. We know that from various texts and from analyzing the remains, the ruins themselves. We have examples of this uh, wide array of expertise, uh, like, for instance, using kruma in the higher parts of the walls in houses in Pompeii. We have examples of masterpieces in Roman architecture, the arch in the cupola of the Pantheon, which is uh, the implementation of what we call Roman concrete, in which the cupola, you see that the core of the structure is made of aggregates which are heavier in the lower part and very light in the upper part, so that they made the cupola of the structure as light as possible so that it could resist on this very large diameter. In conclusion, a few words after we observed these various implementations of stones and after Augustus told us about the symbolic value of stone, let's take a closer look at the value and symbolic value of stones. So the first point I wanted to raise is about theaters that were built in Rome. So, the first theater that was built in Rome was built in 55 before Christ, and it was called Theatrum Lapidium, meaning theater of stone, because it created a revolution in the architecture of theaters, which previously, under the Republic, that banned the construction of any heartstone theatres in Rome or permanent structures for theatres in Rome, they were systematically built in wood and then they were taken down at the end of the season because the Republic was afraid of these uh, gathering places that could be used as a place for people to rebel. Then, a temporary theatre was uh, moved around. The theatres were moved around, but one was moved around which was made of stones. So you see that the import of stones can be criticised as an element of luxury. This is what Pliny the Elder does in his book. So. This is the aspect that's criticized in temporary theaters. Pompeii overcomes this uh, ban and starts building a stone theater, which is a, a very innovative infrastructure that can host uh, uh, several thousands of uh, people as an audience. And thanks to stone, these theatres became a lasting monument to uh, celebrate the memory of Pompeia. So here, the stone has a value that goes beyond that as described by Pliny the Elder, because here, stone 
is a symbol of memory. We have a few texts. Of course, I'm not going to ask you to read them all, but uh, at least not now. But uh, we have a few texts showing that the Romans were very much aware of the fact that the use of uh, terracotta was uh, a continuation, was a, a, a way to, to extend nature, and it shows that the city is a prolongation of nature. So you dig the harbor, you extract rock to build columns that are then used in the theater, and this text shows that building in stone is another way of making the city a prolongation of nature, it's a way of building new mountains. So this text is going to be criticized by Pliny the Elder in his natural history when he says it's crazy to go and import marble from all parts of the empire because we've built ships to transport uh, marble and we transport the summits of the mountain on this raging ocean. So we master nature and we shape it in an exaggerated way. So each time there are different ways to consider the use of stone. Stone being an ambivalent symbol, a symbol of luxury, prestige, very much uh, sought for by some and criticized by others. And in conclusion, I'd like to come back to this uh, masterpiece, which is uh, the Pantheon, to tell you that despite everything we said about the use of and implementation of stones, these monuments certainly embody the power of Rome, a technical power with uh, uh, lots of technical innovations, but symbolically, with all these marbles coming from all provinces in the empire, they show a Rome as a dominating power in the world. And it really embodies that, that. And this embodiment through columns and, and flooring, which reflects all these beautiful shapes and colors, is made possible through small rubbles implemented in the structure of this building, which are used in a very pragmatic way in order to design such a beautiful cupola. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eloise, for this beautiful presentation and for taking us uh, on a trip uh, through Roman cities. We'll take questions. With uh, Adolf Lewis, the, is the next uh, reading of this uh, morning seminar. We will hear Baptiste Perret, who will uh, play this excerpt. Matériau de construction, 28 août 1898. Qu'est-ce qui vaut davantage Un kilo de pierre ou un kilo d'or la question n'a l'air ridicule que pour le commerçant. L'artiste répondra, pour moi, tous les matériaux sont également précieux. La Vénus de Milo aurait autant de valeur si elle était en pierre à gravier. À Paros, on gravillonne les rues avec du marbre de Paros ou en or. La Madone de Saint-Sixte ne vaudrait pas un sou de plus si Raphaël avait mélangé quelques livres d'or à ses couleurs. Un commerçant qui devrait envisager de fondre une Vénus d'or ou de gratter la Madone de Saint-Sixte serait naturellement obligé de raisonner en d'autres termes. L'artiste n'a qu'une ambition. Il veut dominer son matériau de telle manière que son travail devienne indépendant de la valeur de ce qu'il met en œuvre. Malheureusement, nos constructeurs ignorent tout d'une telle ambition. Pour eux, un mètre carré de mur en granit a plus de valeur qu'un mètre carré de mur en mortier. Le granit en soi n'a pourtant aucune valeur. Il forme des chaînes de montagne où il suffit d'aller se servir. 
Avec le granit, on gravillonne les rues, on pave les villes. C'est la pierre la plus commune, le matériau le plus commun que nous connaissions. Et pourtant, il est des gens qui le tiennent pour notre plus précieux matériau de construction. Ces gens disent matériau et pensent travail, travail humain, savoir-faire et art. Car le granit exige beaucoup de travail. Il en faut pour l'arracher aux montagnes, il en faut pour l'amener à son lieu de destination, il en faut pour lui donner la forme convenable, il en faut pour le tailler et le polir. Alors devant un mur de granit poli, notre cœur se mettra à battre. Nous nous sentirons envahis d'un sentiment de vénération. Devant le matériau Non pas. Devant le travail humain. Donc le granit serait tout de même plus précieux que le mortier. Ce n'est pas ce que nous voulons dire. Car une paroi avec des décorations en stuc de Michel-Ange éclipsera même le mur de granit le mieux poli. Ce qui détermine la valeur d'un objet, ce n'est pas seulement la quantité de travail investi, mais aussi sa qualité. Nous vivons en un temps où la quantité de travail fourni compte par-dessus tout. Celle-ci est facile à calculer, elle frappe chacun d'emblée et n'exige ni regard exercé, ni connaissance particulière. Là, il n'y a pas d'erreur. Tant d'ouvriers ont travaillé pendant tant d'heures pour tel salaire. Chacun peut faire le compte. Nous aimons dire à tout le monde la valeur des choses qui nous entourent. Dans cette optique, les matériaux qui réclament le plus long travail seront aussi les plus considérés. On n'a pas toujours pensé ainsi. Autrefois, on construisait avec les matériaux les plus aisément accessibles. En maintes régions avec de la brique, en d'autres avec de la pierre. Ailleurs encore, les murs étaient recouverts de mortiers. Ceux qui construisaient ainsi se sentaient-ils inférieurs à l'architecte qui utilisait la pierre Pourquoi donc Une telle pensée ne venait à l'esprit de personne. Si on avait disposé de carrières dans les environs, on aurait construit en pierre. Amener de loin des pierres destinées à la construction paraissait plus une affaire d'argent qu'une question d'art. Et jadis, l'art, la qualité du travail, comptait plus que de nos jours. De telles époques ont aussi produit de puissants tempéraments créateurs dans l'art architectural. Fischer van Ellark n'avait nul besoin de granit pour se faire comprendre. Avec de l'argile, de la chaux et du sable, il créa des œuvres aussi saisissantes que les meilleurs ouvrages édifiés avec des matériaux difficiles à travailler. Son esprit, son sens artistique ont transfiguré les plus médiocres matières. Il était capable de conférer le prestige de l'art à n'importe quoi. Ce fut un roi dans le domaine des matériaux. Actuellement, ce n'est pas l'artiste qui règne, mais l'ouvrier payé à la journée. Ce n'est pas la pensée créatrice, mais le temps de travail. Et même l'ouvrier à la journée est progressivement dépossédé de sa suprématie, car on a trouvé quelque chose qui exécute mieux et à moindre frais le travail quantitatif, la machine. Cependant, tout travail, que ce soit celui de la machine ou celui du coulis, coûte de l'argent. Et si l'on n'a pas d'argent Alors on se met à feindre un certain temps de travail, on se met à imiter le matériau. La vénération de la quantité de travail est le plus exécrable ennemi de l'artisanat, car il a pour conséquence l'imitation. L'imitation a dépravé une grande partie de notre artisanat. Elle lui a fait perdre toute fierté, tout esprit de probité ouvrière. Imprimeur, que sais-tu faire je sais imprimer de telle manière qu'on croirait voir de la lithographie. Et toi, lithographe Je sais lithographier comme si c'était imprimé. Menuisier, que sais-tu faire Je sais fignoler des ornements qui ont l'air de sortir de la main du stucateur. Mais stucateur, que sais-tu faire J'imite exactement corniche et moulure et je fais des rainures qui paraissent l'œuvre du meilleur tailleur de pierre tant elles sont ressemblantes. J'en fais autant, s'écrit fièrement le flarblantier. Une fois que mes ornements sont peints et satinés, il ne viendrait à l'esprit de personne qu'ils sont en fer blanc. Triste société. Nos artisans semblent se dégrader eux-mêmes à plaisir. Rien d'étonnant que leur situation ne soit pas très bonne. Mais des gens qui raisonnent de la sorte doivent-ils prospérer Menuisier, sois fier d'être menuisier. Le stucateur fait des ornements, va ton chemin sans lui porter envie. Et toi, stucateur que t'importe le tailleur de pierre 
Il fait des rainures. Il doit en faire parce qu'il est moins cher de mettre debout des petites pierres plutôt que des grandes. Sois fier de ce que ton travail ne présente pas les fâcheuses rainures qui coupent colonnes, ornements et murs. Sois fier de ton métier, sois heureux de ne pas être tailleur de pierre. Mais le vent emporte mes paroles. Le public ne peut pas d'artisans fiers de leur métier. Mieux ils savent imiter, plus ils les soutiennent. Le respect des matériaux chers. Il n'est pas de plus sur indice de l'état de parvenu auquel est arrivé notre peuple. Ce respect conduit obligatoirement à une telle attitude. Le parvenu juge humiliant de ne pas se parer de diamants, humiliant de ne pas porter de fourrure, humiliant de ne pas loger dans un palais de pierre depuis qu'il a appris que diamants, fourrure et façade de pierre coûtent beaucoup d'argent. Il ne sait pas que le manque de diamants, de fourrure ou de façade de pierre n'a aucune influence sur la valeur réelle d'un individu. C'est la raison pour laquelle il recourt au succès d'année quand il est à court d'argent. Ridicule entreprise car ceux qui s'appliquent à tromper, ceux qui auraient les moyens de s'entourer de diamants, de fourrures et de façades de pierre ne seront pas trompés. Ils trouveront ces efforts comiques. Et cet illusionnisme sera superflu vis-à-vis -vis des gens de conditions inférieures, puisque le parvenu est de toute façon conscient de sa supériorité. Au cours des dernières décennies, l'imitation a dominé l'ensemble de la construction. La tapisserie était en papier, mais ne devait surtout pas l'avouer. Elle devait imiter les gobelins ou reprendre un motif de tapis ou singer la soie damassée. Les portes et les fenêtres étaient en bois tendre, mais comme le bois dur était plus cher, elles devaient être peintes à l'imitation du bois dur. Le fer était peint en bronze ou en cuivre de manière à être pris pour ces métaux. Du béton, en revanche, qui est une des conquêtes de ce siècle, on ne savait que faire. Comme le béton est en soi un magnifique matériau, on n'avait qu'une pensée lorsqu'il s'agissait de l'utiliser. Une pensée qui traverse régulièrement l'esprit lorsqu'apparaît une nouvelle matière. Que peut-on imiter avec elle On se mit à l'utiliser comme succès d'année de la pierre. Et comme le béton est extraordinairement bon marché, on en fit un extraordinaire gaspillage d'une manière qui, encore une fois, sentait le parvenu. Une véritable maladie du béton s'empara du siècle. « Mon cher architecte, ne pourriez-vous encore orner ma façade d'un peu d'art pour la valeur de cinq florins ?» demandait le vaniteux client. Et l'architecte fixait sur la façade autant d'art qu'on lui en demandait, et quelquefois un peu plus. Actuellement, le béton est utilisé pour imiter les stucs. Il est caractéristique de notre mentalité viennoise que moi, qui me suis toujours violemment élevé contre le faux usage des matériaux et l'imitation, je me sois vu traité de bas matérialiste. Admirons le sophisme. Ceux qui me traitaient de la sorte étaient des individus qui attribuaient une telle valeur aux matériaux qu'ils ne reculaient devant aucune bassesse pour recourir à des succès d'années. Thank you very much, Baptiste. Let's travel in time with Jean-Philippe Garic, architect and professor of history, the, the history of architecture at the University Paris 1, Pantheon Sorbonne. And uh, let's immerse ourselves in uh, the Paris of uh, Baron Haussmann. Why? Uh, Why the Paris of Haussmann? Well, the, we wanted to look at the standardization of stone in the building of the city of Paris, uh, especially uh, with Napoleon III and Baron Haussmann. Thank you very much. Let me take a picture before I begin my presentation, and why not? So, no comment on uh, this reading uh, uh, from uh, um, a text by Adolf Loos, but uh, what's interesting is that at the time he wasn't interested in the agency of the material and not the intention of the construction, but himself in many of his uh, uh, buildings used the, uh, a material for its value, the green marble in particular, a material he used uh, in a very different uh, uh, manner. 
So stone, uh, uh, from an architectural point of view, has a number of qualities and values, bears a number of values uh, which are quite varied. Uh, stone has mechanical properties, uh, resistance to crushing and so on which justifies its uh, use and the research uh, 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 that is made on stone. The quality varies according to the type of stone. And uh, today I was asked to talk about uh, uh, the Haussmannian city. Uh, so I will talk about this uh, Paris stone. Uh, Saint Maximin Saint Lo Stone, which is extracted from quarries uh, 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 in the north of the Paris basin, and I will look at the complexity. I will not dwell on the complexity of the different stones used in Paris. So, stone has a number of technological qualities. It also has uh, uh, aesthetic qualities. It can be very white or colored, very much colored. It can have different textures. So its appearance varies tremendously. And finally, stone bears a number of cultural values which we have seen in the previous conference. The, the, the reading of uh, Adolf uh, Loos, especially. So these cultural values convey uh, um, the, um, the collective imagination we have on antiquity. It's a uh, telluric quality that we see in runes and which lends to building something uh, uh, um, that is timeless and uh, continuous. This is very typical of the stone. Another cultural value is the tradition of various crafts attached to stone, the use of stone in French uh, trades and craftsmanship, the use of stone uh, means uh, uh, um, uh, a certain prestige and excellency in the Paris architecture. Uh, there are many buildings we can think of, uh, uh, many landmarks. So there are many reasons to use stone, but in my presentation we shall see uh, that uh, uh, there are many perspectives. I will just focus on some of them. Uh, 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 I will focus on a limited uh, uh, period of time compared to the former uh, conference. Here we'll focus on a few decades. And uh, geographically, uh, of, of course, Paris is much uh, smaller than the Roman Empire. Also, uh, this is a subject which is less studied than antiquity, uh, the Roman antiquity in particular. So the Haussmannian uh, period of time is less studied, even though uh, we have many more sources. Uh, uh, um, so this, is, this comes as a paradox. I'm not myself a, a specialist of the archaeology of the built environment. So what I will uh, present to you to, today comes from the, the history of architecture and my knowledge of uh, architecture as an architect. As a reminder, Let's, uh, uh, well, the, the stone construction, stone building is a very old French tradition. Here you have two images uh, coming from the many works which were published in France on the topic of stone building. This is from Abraham Boss from 1643. This uh, uh, perspective of a French tradition of a stone uh, building was very well studies, studied by uh, Jean-Marie Pierros de Monclos, uh, who worked uh, a book called uh, uh, Architecture, uh, French-style architecture. He dedicated uh, several chapters 
on stone construction, uh, vaults, uh, ar arches, and this is a, a, a landmark in terms of uh, French-style architecture. This is a remarkable work for anyone interested in uh, the use of stone. So this long French, long-standing French tradition was uh, extensively studied, uh, in particular uh, concerning structures and the art of vaults. Here you have two pictures, one coming from uh, Viollet-le-Duc, his article uh, uh, on his uh, dictionary uh, on architecture. The construction, the stone construction for Violet le Duc is the very core of architecture, of the, the, the great lesson of medieval architecture. Here you have a barrel vault on this picture. You see the various elements which allow you to understand stability and the installation of the structure. And this uh, specific stone construction is or represents uh, for Violet le Duc the opposite, uh, so to speak, of uh, the qualities of uh, academic architecture, uh, which was taught in the Academy of uh, the Fine Arts uh, Academy, which focused more on proportions and form. Here you have an organic dimension, the organic dimension of the building. And next, there's a photography of the side uh, galleries of the Chapelle Expiatoire which was built in 1815, from 1815. I wanted to show this French-style tradition of stone construction and how this tradition has continued over time. Adolf Loeff denounced uh, the, the, the artificial nature of, of architecture, of, of the use of stone, and uh, Pierre uh, Fontaine uh, 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 shows in his uh, book uh, the different ways of working a stone as a material in a, neo in a ne neoclassical uh, tradition, a long-term tradition of, of the construction of vaults. So this specific aspect uh, continues to this day. It's very much alive today as a central value uh, uh, for monument, monumental architecture in France. Uh, at the moment, I'm part of a jury uh, who will recruit the name architects for the historical monuments of Paris without uh, uh, letting out too much of... Uh, uh, Without revealing too much, I can tell you that the stone uh, building is very much important in our recruitment, looking at these aspects. Stone is not only a, a component of a structure in French architecture, it is also an element which allows to uh, uh, create forms, the facades uh, or parts of buildings uh, where we focus on the structure, the texture. And in my introduction, I chose one example, the uh, um, uh, Ecole de Médecine, uh, uh, Medicine School, uh, a building that dates back from 1769. Uh, Here you have stone facades, uh, uh, which are very much polished. You have cornices, capitals, uh, which are we finally crafted and a, a series of uh, bas-relief. Stone is very much adapted to this transposition of a drawing of a sketch, this uh, French stone coming from the Paris region is very much uh, adapted to this transposition from a sketch. Uh, which is very specific, very precise, 
In the French classical tradition for architectural elements, well, it's very rigorous, uh, um, very detailed, and stone is very much adapted uh, to this uh, uh, rigor and this type of uh, construction. Speaking of uh, Haussmann, the Haussmann period in Paris, uh, this is something which is very much limited in time. When Baron Haussmann and the prefect of uh, the Seine participated in this undertaking, but of course uh, uh, this also refers to something much older after the fall of the Second, uh, which continued after the fall of the Second Empire. So the construction of uh, the system of uh, roads and public spaces uh, during Haussmann, uh, the, the buildings uh, 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 within uh, that project, this dates back from uh, well, they are just as old as the mid-18th century, whereby the, the Paris of the former regime was criticized. It was a political criticism. In fact, uh, the, the work of Richard Wittmann showed uh, uh, how uh, uh, in the 18th century, we criticized uh, the, the city of Paris as a metaphor of uh, a political, uh, the political problems which uh, prevailed at the time. Uh, so the city of Haussmann uh, is, is an image of uh, uh, the politics at the time. It's a political will to meet these uh, criticisms of the past and of political uh, um, problems. So it started uh, uh, before the First Empire with Napoleon. Napoleon was uh, trained under the former regime and wanted to show uh, that the, the former uh, regime and uh, uh, the, the problems, uh, the, the inherent problems as to the city, construction problems, sewage, uh, uh, the lack of sewage systems, and so on. Uh, so it is important to understand this aspect uh, 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 as a representation of a political order. So the Rue de Rivoli, Haussmann before Haussmann. On the Rue de Rivoli, you can already see a number of uh, qualities that you will find in the Haussmannian city. So the Rue de Rivoli wasn't designed uh, initially as a transit road. It was designed as a facade, uh, which was a, a sort of showcase uh, for the Jardin des Tuileries, the Tuileries Gardens. Uh, so it differentiates this itself from the Haussmannian uh, routes, but it gives you an idea of a regular linear stone architecture in this engraving from 1806. You can see the stone in different states, different conditions. What remains of the convent of Feuillon, which was used as a stone quarry. Uh, this was often the case of uh, with dismantled uh, buildings uh, during the revolution. Uh, the, the Count of Montalembert uh, uh, talked about the despoiling of uh, uh, monuments during the revolution or the, during the revolutionary period. So the idea was not so much to destroy symbols, but to, but rather to recover uh, materials. The issue of materials is uh, relative to the issue of transportation. At the time, we didn't have a, a, a mechanical uh, a transport uh, um, vehicles, so it's not an ecological. Uh, uh, agenda here, but it's really to recover materials. So the Rue de Rivoli was built, first of all, 
It was first uh, designed by Charles Percier and Pierre Fontaine, the architect. Then this was validated by Van Napoleon in 1802, and then implemented immediately in a way we can see here. You can see the, the construction of arcades. Uh, 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 which are not yet carrying a, a building on its, uh, above. So uh, first, uh, uh, Pierre Fontaine, the architect of Napoleon, asked one of his uh, entrepreneurs to build the arcades of Rue de Rivoli. He was pay paid with uh, um, a number of terrains, which were public uh, or national goods, national properties, so building a building on these arcades was the plan. Uh, each building uh, had to be built in, built uh, on the pre-existing arcades. The other aspect which can be sh uh, demonstrated with this image is that the city was built very slowly. It is interesting from a historical point of view. It was a, a, a slow process because it was a very political endeavor and uh, uh, French entrepreneurs uh, 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 would rather build elsewhere than within this uh, political atmosphere. So uh, uh, with the fall of Napoleon, the, the, this uh, street was finally built, the Rue de Rivoli. It was uh, approved uh, uh, later on, the, the construction of this uh, Rue de Rivoli, and Baron Haussmann, um, one of his first decisions was to continue the Rue de Rivoli all the way to the Rue de Louvre, so there's a continuation between uh, Napoleon uh, I and... Uh, and and uh, Baron Haussmann, started, which started with this continuation. This picture was not taken on purpose, but uh, if you look at the picture to the right, you see the uh, difference in materials used in the uh, street level arcades, which are built uh, with larger stones, in harder stone, and the buildings erected on top of the arcades, because as I said, all this was built in two steps. The arcades were first built to sort of design the road, the street, or to delineate the street, and then the uh, dwellings and the houses were built on top of the arcades using a more common stone. So that's a model that is quite archetypal of the uh, Hasmanian city. And that's at the origin of the project that Napoleon III and Haussmann, acting as his prefect for the, sitting of Paris, for the city of Paris, started developing. From this uh, sketch showing an aerial view for the project of bringing together Tuileries and Louvre, in 1813, uh, this project uh, kept uh, Napoleon III very busy. We have very little left because the Tuileries Palace uh, was destroyed. We just have the carousel and a few uh, uh, buildings left alongside the uh, Rue de Rivoli. But this project is an architectural and urban project for the heart of Paris. And in this sketch, you see a series of buildings surrounding the monument itself. That's the case at the top of the image with the uh, buildings that uh, shape uh, an hemicycle. And beyond uh, the, the sketch, you see that before the Palais Royal, you have two buildings that uh, 
are next to the uh, palace uh, complex, so there is a chapel and an opera, because in the Napoleon tradition there is an opera. But they all have the same facade as the uh, Rivoli Street. They all have uh, a standard facade with arcades on the street level, and they have this uh, um, uh, uh, terrace level on the first floor. So uh, this is the intention to show that a city could be all standardized and that a model could be decided and then repeated forever. So that at the opposite of the medieval or post-medieval cities, which to the architects of the Enlightenment uh, showed too many dissimilarities. So all of a sudden, you shift to the extreme opposite with models which uh, for the, are the London rebuilt after the major fire or the city of Torino which was built according to a very regular square uh, pattern, which was a dream for uh, Parisian architects and urban planners who saw it as the ideal urban order as opposed to the chaos that reigned in Paris. Just between you and I, this uh, willingness for order in Haussmann's plans very rapidly changed. And when Voltaire asked, demanded a more ordered and a more regular city in the 18th century, you see that as of, as of the very first years of the Haussmann period, you have lots of period that came to criticize this uh, and talking about Torino as a city that was cast in stone in a huge uh, wafer uh, mold. So that's the risk when you move from too much disorder to too much regularity. Now, the uh, plaster city before the uh, city of stone. This is uh, ex an excerpt from a manual for masons that shows how you can build, design a building that would look like an old building from an almost medieval structure. What you can see to the right of the facade here, which was engraved by Charles Normand, is a building with the foundations made of stone, the, the upper floors are made with wooden beams in a style that was already uh, used in Paris in the 15th century. And this is a uh, kind of an Italian style drawing with uh, this Belvedere in the upper part, the hierarchy between the different uh, st uh, stories. You have a piano nobile uh, type of architecture, and you have a disjunction between the image that you want to, 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 to show, that of an architecture that imitates stones thanks to uh, plaster and stucco, and what's in the background. In the background here, you can see in grey all the elements in the uh, beams of the wooden beams, which are then covered with uh, uh, plaster elements. That's a city as produced during the revolutionary July government. And this idea that was criticized by Adolf Loos, this idea of imitating uh, prestigious material using um, fictitious materials is predominating back in the days because that's the beginning of the industrial period in France uh, and uh, inventors are booming. And the main objective of, invent of inventions is to produce the aspect of what was kept for higher social classes but produce that at a lesser cost. So providing everybody with marble facade is one objective that um, builders have at the time. And 
this is a, a dissemination of some values that were reserved to a small elite in the uh, France of the Kings. So this uh, city of plaster and stucco and this fictitious stone produced with other means is something that you can find a bit everywhere. And moving to a city of brick like Toulouse, well, back in the days in Toulouse, buildings were made of bricks, but then they were painted in yellow ochre in order to imitate stone, because brick was a substitution material in a region that was not very rich in stones in order to produce, and it was covered in this uh, with this painting in order to give the appearance of a stone building. So that's how architecture adapts to economic realities. And at the beginning of the 19th century, there was a debate raging about uh, fires. And some people said that uh, wooden constructions should be banned. In Paris, as a plaster is uh, rather a good fireproof material, we don't have such problems. But in Toulouse, the rehabilitation of uh, buildings with wooden beams was banned, and well, demolition was not instructed. But uh, people were told, okay, well, when you rehabilitate rehabilitate your building, you'll have to replace the wooden beams by other materials. And this is when people started uh, hiding and camouflaging the beams. So, in the Hosman days, there is a big shift that starts from elements which are already present. Stone constructions were very much present in Paris already. Rue de Rivoli uh, is a, a street I mentioned as being the uh, first example of the Haussmannian uh, tran transformations. You know that in Paris we have many streets bearing the names of Haussmann's uh, predecessors, uh, Rambuteau, Berger. All these are streets which are the first main streets uh, st and straight streets in Paris. The shift with the Haussmann era is a change of scale. Everything became available from a cultural and technological perspective, but this time everything is, is, is implemented on a much larger scale, which corresponds to the development of uh, uh, modern banking systems, of uh, the stock market. So the production of a Haussmannian city is no longer based on individual wealth, but on uh, listed companies, on banks. It's a different scale of capitalism altogether that also accounts for this. Now, the material has to be transported. And as you can see here, well, the, the picture is not very good quality, but it's a, a, a photography taken in 1850 showing the transportation of large blocks of stones on Pont Neuf in Paris. So you see that they're still using the most traditional transportation means. There aren't many differences between the way stones were transported in 1850 and the way they'd been transported for centuries before. So this all these anthropological and physical aspects of stones are found under many different forms. This is what gives its value to the material. It's the huge challenge for workers, for uh, transportation, etc., etc. Stone has this monumental quality and therefore stone monuments in Paris inherit from the 
major monuments of the past, like the pyramids. And this fuels the imagination of uh, various builders back in the days. This uh, uh, drawing shows a demolition. It's a satirical um, drawing because it shows architects Fontaine and Philippe standing before the demolition of the Tuileries Passant. There is no caption for political reasons. The Louis XIV of 1831 and his Le Nord. This was the caption that was written in pencil and then erased afterwards. Uh, that was a way to mock uh, the new emperor. And you see here his architects uh, uh, standing before the demolition of uh, a, a beautiful building. And you see the workers and the physical struggle they have with the material. It's something that uh, was mentioned by my colleague before me. The anthropological uh, symbol of stone in a reconstruction of a city like Paris back in the day. That back in the day, Paris was a huge work site, a work site in which you had a daily spectacle looking at stone, transportation, cutting, implementation, etc., etc. It's difficult to imagine that today, but it was a daily a spectacle, and then you had the presence of these workers on the streets, in bars. So the, the, the city of stone is not just the outcome that we have today. It's also a city in which stone is circulating, is being worked on, is um, related to certain trades, etc., etc., and to certain guilds. Oh, yes, I apologize. I have to reach my conclusion. Sorry. So, here, this drawing shows a district close to the Bastille uh, prison with men working on blocks which are bigger than themselves. Here you have a picture of high-skilled workers in the Paris Opera. They are working on sculpted uh, uh, decors on the facade. This is a mock-up at the Conservatory of Arts and Crafts, and it was produced by an entrepreneur showing the modernization of the uh, site. That's the industrial aspects in Osmanian work sites. You see a steam uh, engine uh, to the right. So there is this uh, routing in the past, but at the same time, there is modern industrial tools being used. So it's the past being industrialized. So you have the steam engine, you have the implementation of materials to be placed on the, on the facades. And you see the industrial materials associated to Osmanian uh, cities with the cast iron flooring, the plaster beams, the brick walls, and some secondary walls made of wood. So the city of stone is a city of monuments. This is a spectacular facade of the Court of Justice in Paris. And here, you see the Dauphine Square being uh, turned into some kind of a Roman forum. That's the fine art type of model. But the idea of the Rome made of marble, the, Ro the city made of stone that architects wanted to cut and paste in Paris, even though it meant destroying a perfectly emblematic place such as the Dauphine Square. This is the inside of the entrance hall. Uh, this is an opportunity, this picture is an opportunity for me to show you that uh, we don't have a lot of documents about this, but the book, there is one book that's still a standard. Here we see st stone in three 
sur un terrain. Formes, the first one being the Hussmanian buildings, then you have the uh, pebbles that were selected for the streets of Paris, then you have the granite pavement, and the macadam that was uh, started to be used in Paris in 1829 to allow people to walk on a flat surface. Macadam being tar, and it's a, an agglomerate of uh, small materials. materials. So beyond the uh, monotonous aspect of these uh, facades, uh, the Hussmanian city is also very eclectic because it combines various architectural styles which can be expressed in a more or less visible way. To the left, you have a standard Osmanian building on Rue des Maturins, built by Soufaché. To the right, you have a detail despite from French architecture dating back to the 17th century, and the stone is adorned with lots of details. And, uh, so much so that uh, it seems that engraving echoes this very mechanical work on stone and then stone becomes a very neutral material that um, uh, is prone to or is apt to being styled with any kind of technique. So here you see the engraving but we could uh, then talk about the models which have been used for these um, facade decals. Here, referring to the first presentation, in this generation of architects, here are drawings drawn by Labrus when he uh, stayed in Italy. And in opposition to the neoclassic era, there is an interest for materiality. Here, Labrus is drawing walls. So you have uh, polygonal stones. And this uh, wall was in Signa. This is the details of an, another door in Filleri. And this architect, who won the prize of Rome, was sketching these walls stone by stone just to observe the architectural quality which is associated to these stones. And this then finds its echoes in the uh, city of stone of Paris. I took an example because that's an architect which is uh, who is quite uh, singular but also close to Slapos, that's Jules Amoudrou. He built a few buildings in Paris in which the idea of surface, of cladding, of decor, you say, see that between the column and the archway, he, you have the wall which is totally bare and then he works with hollows on the access to what's called the passage of desire which is located which is a, an indoor uh, gallery uh, between two streets and it he implemented all possible technical uh, possibilities offered by stones you see here a picture showing that the symbolic element to the right was corrected in the engraving in order to look less shocking but you see here the various techniques and stone cutting techniques that were implemented. So in conclusion, I'd like to talk about alternative assumptions or projects that emerged very quickly and were materialized through, can be materialized through two, two images. One is a picture public, uh, a drawing published by Violet Le Duc in which she proposes an architecture that would uh, uh, be true to the French Middle Ages using iron beams and bricks. So that's an architecture which is opposed to the city of stone. This is a city in which you don't use industrial techniques to produce buildings that would give a, an impression of continuity with the past. But we're building an industrial city that uh, 
reactivates the uh, inheritance of the Middle Ages. In the very same years, Jules Le Saunier built in Noisiel the uh, main building of the Meunier factory in Noisiel using uh, materials and techniques which are quite comparable. So this is my conclusion and this is my last picture to show you a building which is uh, very famous. It's the Castel Belanger by Guimard. Um, Guimard won the first facade competition organized by the city of Paris at a time when the uh, stone facade was considered as boring and in which um, uh, architects wanted to go beyond the Hasmanian period in the techniques they implemented and in the materials they were using. So this is going beyond, going past the city of stone. So this building can be called Art Nouveau because the materials which are implemented are quite many and that's done on purpose. You have uh, uh, Paris stone, brick, metal, uh, painted metal here to add uh, uh, some diversity to the facade. And then you also have uh, sandstone that's also associated to that to create a diversity in color. So the comment is that opening to multicolors or polychromy based on the variety of materials only was not very successful in Paris. Paris remained mostly a white city, uh, despite a few other examples. But the 20th century uh, continued with this very small palette of colors and, and just look at Paris. There are very few buildings that break away with this uh, Parisian uh, tradition. There I am. There you go. Thank you. And sorry, I spoke for a bit too long. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe Garrick, for this presentation. It was truly fascinating to immerse ourselves in the political aspect of the stone uh, uh, during uh, the during uh, uh, the Haussmann period. Uh, in Paris. As an architect, it's very interesting to me as well to see how mat uh, materials are used, whether it is uh, wood uh, or stone. So uh, let's take a coffee break and we will continue uh, later on with a diff different uh, keynote speaker. Thank you. So first of all, a reading, uh, Oscar Nemea, the Brazilian architect uh, who created uh, this beautiful uh, place, uh, first uh, except talks about uh, this project, what uh, led to this project, and uh, then it's uh, an excerpt from another work. Lola is going to read these excerpts. Que reste-t-il de l'architecture passée Ce ne sont pas les ravissantes maisons blanches des îles grecques de la Méditerranée. Ce sont les cathédrales, les palais, les châteaux, les grands monuments qui ont marqué l'évolution de l'architecture. Jadis, les dimensions des ouvertures des portes et des fenêtres dépendaient de la portée des pierres de taille, des poutres de bois ou des arcs de briques. Résultat, elles étaient étroites et laisser passer difficilement la lumière. Par la suite, l'architecture a évolué grâce à l'utilisation de nouveaux matériaux qui ont permis d'élargir l'espace. Puis la Renaissance est arrivée avec sa recherche permanente de la beauté. Quand le béton a fait son apparition, tout a changé. Car dans la nouvelle architecture, les murs soutenaient les bâtiments. Plus maintenant. Désormais, c'est la structure qui soutient les étages. J'en ai donné la preuve dans tous les monuments que j'ai construits, de sorte que je me refuse aujourd'hui à m'expliquer auprès de ceux qui continuent à me poser des questions. Un architecte italien, Pierre Luigi Nervi, mort à la fin des années 70, l'a bien dit. Avec le béton armé, le domaine de la fantaisie créatrice en matière de construction acquiert une ampleur quasi illimitée. C'est une sorte de pierre artificielle qui peut absorber toutes les forces de traction. De plus, 
Il se moule et peut donc prendre toutes les formes souhaitées par l'architecte. Mais c'est là où réside le danger, car il suffit de la moindre erreur pour détruire l'esthétique. Il faut donc à la fois maîtriser la technique et faire preuve de sensibilité artistique, ce qui n'est pas facile. J'en donnerai un exemple. La mezzanine du ministère des Affaires étrangères à Brasilia a une épaisseur de 50 cm à peine pour une portée de 40 mètres. Je me souviens qu'un ingénieur italien qui l'a vu pour la première fois a été estomaqué. « Nous sommes en train de construire un pont d'une portée de 1000 mètres », m'a-t-il confié. « Mais je dois avouer que cette mezzanine si mince est beaucoup plus difficile à faire. »« Si ma mémoire ne me trompe pas, je crois d'ailleurs qu'un spécialiste des ponts, Eugène Fressinet, qui a construit l'autoroute de la Guaira à Caracas, au Venezuela, avait déjà affirmé qu'il se faisait fort de construire un pont en béton armé d'une portée de 1000 mètres. » Comme quoi, la technique permet toutes les prouesses. Encore faut-il que l'architecte sache faire preuve de sensibilité et d'imagination pour transformer un chef-d'œuvre d'architecture en un chef-d'œuvre tout court qui entre dans le domaine de l'art. Une fois de plus, il suffit de peu de choses pour déraper et réaliser un projet qui ne serait qu'un tour de force architectonique. Autrement dit, l'architecture ne peut être belle que si elle est le fruit d'une invention pure, d'une rupture inédite. Je n'ai aucun enthousiasme pour l'architecture rationaliste, avec ses limites fonctionnelles, sa rigidité structurelle, ses dogmes et ses théories. Le béton armé permet à l'architecte qui a le sens de la poésie de s'exprimer. L'architecture est faite de songes et de fantaisies, de courbes et des grands espaces libres. Il faut savoir inventer en faisant appel à toutes les techniques qui sont à notre disposition. Pourquoi se soumettre à des règles, à des principes intangibles Quand j'ai conçu le monument public de Brasilia, je n'ai pas lu une seule revue d'architecture afin de ne pas me laisser influencer. Je l'ai fait sciemment. Ce que j'admire le plus chez un architecte, c'est sa liberté. Gaudi, dont l'œuvre la plus célèbre est l'église inachevée de la Sagrada Familia à Barcelone, est un architecte confus. Mais il a eu le courage d'enfreindre les règles établies et de réaliser ainsi l'union d'une technique audacieuse et d'un lyrisme remarquable. En cela, il occupe une place particulière dans l'architecture moderne. Même si le corbusier a joué un rôle bien plus important. Lorsque j'ai fait le ministère des Affaires étrangères à Brasilia, je ne me suis pas lancé dans une nouvelle forme d'architecture, comme certains l'ont écrit. J'ai tout simplement voulu prouver qu'il était facile de faire quelque chose qui plaise à tous, une architecture techniquement correcte, mais généreuse, qui n'exige pas de sensibilité particulière. Ce n'est pas le palais qui correspond le mieux à mon tempérament, mais c'est vrai que beaucoup le préfèrent à d'autres. Il est bien construit, moderne, entouré de jardins et de plans d'eau qui le rendent attrayant. Je ne devrais pas faire cet aveu, car certains pourraient penser que je me suis joué de ma propre architecture. Absolument pas. Picasso n'a-t-il pas fait des toiles classiques qui témoignent de sa maîtrise de la peinture J'ai toujours réagi contre cette architecture qui doit être techniquement bien faite dans les règles. Ce n'est absolument pas ça. L'œuvre architecturale doit être belle, légère, différente. Comment croire qu'on a bâti un monument ou un palais esthétiquement remarquable si, en regardant derrière soi, on constate qu'on n'a rien fait de nouveau, qu'on s'est contenté d'imiter le passé Quand le corbusier, cet architecte si remarquable, a monté les rampes du palais du Congrès à Brasilia, il a eu ces mots que je n'ai pas oubliés. Ici, il y a de l'invention. On peut ne pas aimer les monuments et les palais que j'ai construits pour la nouvelle capitale du Brésil. Mais personne ne niera qu'on n'a jamais rien vu de pareil. C'est la question que je pose toujours à ceux qui ont vu Brasilia et qui en reviennent avec un esprit critique. Vous n'aimez pas le palais du Congrès Vous trouvez son architecture délirante, sans intérêt, leur dis-je, mais... Avez-vous vu ailleurs quelque chose de pareil Là est le point de départ de l'architecture, la vraie. Elle ne doit pas être un exercice d'imitation, sauf à la limite lorsqu'il s'agit de construction immobilière. Il faut savoir se dépasser, faire preuve d'imagination.
mes relations avec le Parti communiste français ont toujours été et restent encore fondées sur la compréhension et l'amitié. Je n'ai reçu qu'attention et considération de la part d'hommes comme Georges Marchais, Roland Leroy, Georges Gosna ou Jacques Tricot, par exemple. C'est cela qui m'a permis de réaliser, en toute liberté, le siège du parti place du colonel Fabien, en collaboration avec Jean Prouvé, Jean de Roche et Paul Chemetov. C'est une œuvre qui a eu de nombreuses répercussions et qui constitue aujourd'hui encore un lieu de visite. Je me souviens du jour où le président Pompidou m'a invité à déjeuner avec tous les architectes qui faisaient partie du jury pour le concours du Centre Georges Pompidou. Quelqu'un à table commenta la réalisation du siège du Parti communiste français et Pompidou, sans cacher sa position de droite, dut reconnaître que c'était la seule bonne chose que les communistes avaient faite. Et l'éloge ne fut pas contredit. Le siège du PCF suscitait l'admiration générale. Mais ce n'est pas seulement le succès de cette œuvre qui m'a attaché à certains bons camarades du parti. C'est aussi la lutte politique, plus importante pour nous que l'architecture. On va continuer donc, pour cette deuxième partie de la matinale. On continue aussi avec des lectures. Et cette fois, avec un autre grand nom de l'architecture moderniste, donc Charles-Édouard Jeanneret dit aussi Le Corbusier. Et on va écouter un extrait par Lola Mom de Vers l'architecture de 1923, en fait. On voyait au beau jour d'antan, et cela dure toujours, hélas, de gros chevaux qui amenaient dans les chantiers d'énormes pierres et beaucoup d'hommes pour les descendre de dessus la voiture, pour les couper, les tailler, les monter sur les échafaudages, les ajuster en vérifiant longuement, mettre en main, leurs six faces. Une maison, ça se construisait en deux ans. Aujourd'hui, on monte des immeubles en quelques mois. Le PO vient de terminer son immense frigorifique de Tolbiac. Il n'est entré dans ce chantier que des grains de sable et de mâche fer gros comme des noisettes. Les murs sont minces comme des membranes. Il y a dans ce bâtiment des charges énormes. Des murs minces pour protéger contre les différences de température et des cloisons de 11 cm malgré les charges énormes. Les choses ont bien changé. La crise des transports a sévi. On s'est aperçu que les maisons représentaient un tonnage formidable. Si l'on diminuait ce tonnage des 4 cm, voilà un état d'esprit moderne. La guerre a secoué les torpeurs. On a parlé de taylorisme. On en a fait. Les entrepreneurs ont acheté des machines ingénieuses, patientes et agiles. Les chantiers seront-ils bientôt des usines On parle de maisons qu'on coule par le haut avec du béton liquide, en un jour, comme on remplirait une bouteille. Et de fil en aiguille après avoir fabriqué en usine tant de canons, d'avions, de camions, de wagons, on se dit, ne pourrait-on pas fabriquer des maisons Voilà un état d'esprit tout à fait d'époque. Rien n'est prêt, mais tout peut être fait. Dans les 20 années à venir, l'industrie aura groupé les matériaux fixes, semblables à ceux de la métallurgie. La technique aura porté bien au-delà de ce que nous connaissons, le chauffage, l'éclairage et les modes de structure rationnels. Les chantiers ne seront plus des éclosions sporadiques où tous les problèmes se compliquent en s'entassant. L'organisation financière et sociale réalisera, avec des méthodes concertées et puissantes, le problème de l'habilitation et les chantiers qui seront immenses et gérés et exploités comme des administrations. Les lotissements urbains et sururbains seront vastes et orthogonaux, et non plus désespérément biscornus. Ils permettront l'emploi de l'élément de série et l'industrialisation du, du chantier. L'on cessera peut-être enfin de construire sur mesure. L'évolution sociale fatale 
aura transformé les rapports entre locataires et propriétaires, aura modifié les conceptions de l'habitation et de l'habitation, et les villes seront ordonnées au lieu d'être chaotiques. La maison ne sera plus cette chose épaisse et qui prétend défier les siècles et qui est l'objet opulent par quoi se manifeste la richesse. Elle sera un outil comme l'auto devient un outil. La maison ne sera plus une entité archaïque, lourdement enracinée dans le sol par de profondes fondations, bâtie de dur et à la dévotion de laquelle s'est instauré depuis si longtemps le culte de la famille, de la race, etc. Si l'on arrache du cœur et de l'esprit les concepts immobiles de la maison et qu'on envisage la question d'un point de vue critique et objectif, on arrivera à la maison outil, maison en série accessible à tous, saine, incomparablement plus que l'ancienne et moralement aussi, et belle de l'esthétique des outils de travail qui accompagnent notre existence. Merci beaucoup, Lola. Euh, nous accueillons maintenant Cyril Simonet, qui est euh, architecte, historien et professeur à la faculté de l'Université de Genève. Let's welcome euh, Cyril Simonet, an architect, historian and professor at the Faculty of Literature at the University of Geneva. We will uh, look at the different stages of concrete uh, in architecture from uh, the development of artificial stone to the use of reinforced concrete. Invitation qui m'honore. Alors, le titre de la présentation, c'est euh, de la pierre factice au béton armé. Voilà. Alors, il Thank you. Good morning, une, ladies and gentlemen. Une aventure qui sur First of all, I would like to thank the Academy of Savoir-Faire of the Foundation of Hermès for their invitation. Before starting my presentation, I will just drink some water. Donc, euh, I apologize. Okay. La, la du Louvre, donc so the title of this presentation is From Artificial Stone to Reinforced Concrete. So it's un a de son, une note de cette it is a journey spanning two or three centuries. Capacité, si je puis dire, qui, uh, well, for the subject, uh, the matter of uh, uh, interest, I will start with a quote and I will also end with a quote by Claude Perrault, an architect who, who has been mentioned previously. Uh, we talked about the uh, colonnade of the Louvre from the 17th century. So the quote, it is also the great beauty of a building that it appears to be made of a single stone. So this is uh, his translation translation of Vitruvius, and this uh, uh, speaks of the compactness of um, the, the, the spirit of architects at the time. Another quote, I apologize for that, but I would like to start with, to start with these leading figures like Ferchaud de Réaumur, Réaumur, a naturalist, a, a, a scholar who invented a barometer, uh, a famous uh, barometer, uh, he also studied insects, uh, and he wrote a memoir on the formation of stones uh, and to look at the origins of the hardness of stones. So again, the hardness of stone is very much the heart of the matter. So the quote, we will not have any difficulty in calling the water that is charged with the matter inherent to the formation of this and all other kinds of stone, a lapidary juice or a stony juice or sap. It's quite uh, organic here. The stone is very much alive and, and gendered, uh, so to speak. So here, two images to illustrate uh, uh, this, uh, these quotes. Uh, the first picture being the discovery of Herculaneum. It's a drawing. The second one is a Roman uh, building, so, so a new curiosity sort of emerged around the uh, issue of Roman uh, concrete.
read a number of explorers or, let's say, um, architects, uh, travelers, and the first archaeologists uh, 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 were interested uh, in this. The discovery of Herculaneum, Herculaneum was made in 1738, and they were interested in the origins of hardness. So the Academy of Science received a number of memoirs uh, uh, which uh, approached the manufacturing of mortar, of lime, and uh, which addressed the, uh, um, the, the hardness of stone from lime scale that you calcinate, uh, and this leads to lime. How can you then uh, get with the addition of water a sort of hardening, a transformation which is problematic. All of these memoirs sent to the Academy of Science are trying to offer a number of uh, experiments or to explain phenomena. On the left, uh, you have the polycarp of the uh, fold, which explains uh, pyramids. The author did, hadn't even visited the pyramids. It was difficult to, to go there at the time. Time, but talking about artificial blocks which led to the construction of such pyramids. So in architecture, there's the issue of construction, the theory of construction at, uh, in this period of time. Now we're in the early 18th century. In a nutshell, nutshell architecture uh, relies on, on two uh, pillars. Uh, uh, we saw it in the previous uh, conference. There's, there is the knowledge of, the, of stone cutting, the work around the stone which is uh, ordered uh, by uh, th through a, a chain of production, stone masons, uh, um, stone setters, uh, and uh, in addition to the knowledge and the know-how of architects. So, uh, you have construction and production of architecture through the existence of two geometries, the geometry of the stone mason, you have a drawing here um, to illustrate this. Uh, it is always difficult uh, to interpret that if you don't have this geometrical knowledge. And there's also the geometry of the architect. You have the materials that are being worked on. Uh, so you have a competition uh, between these two geometries, but they're also complementary. So you have the stone mason, the stone setter, the architect working together, and this is uh, uh, this works together in a structural, structural manner. So the 18th century, the, the century of encyclopedias, of the Enlightenment, uh, uh, the century of leading figures uh, who are very much interested in, in uh, uh, specific uh, domains, and uh, they focus, uh, uh, among other subjects, on construction. So there is the, after the invention comes the inventory. If you look at construction knowledge, construction methods, traditionally, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, made, uh, it was done with incorporations, the knowledge was uh, passed on vertically, and, and progressively it became uh, public knowledge, public domain, through the publication of uh, scholarly works. Uh, but before this knowledge was kept within the, the limits of corporations, and uh, at, one, at a given time, there was the mathematization of knowledge in construction as well. So you have new ways of seeing, of interpreting, of understanding especially in terms of knowledge, the theory of the, the thrust of the vaults, with the works of uh, Philippe de Laire, with the writings of uh, fortification engineers such as Bellidor. So construction will escape gradually the, the cloud, the traditional cloud of uh, mason uh, masters, the masters of masonry. To, uh, uh, in a nutshell, 
there is the theory of architecture, which is uh, still alive in the 18th century, from the first treaties of architecture, Alberti, Vignol, Palladio, uh, Philippe L. Delorme, uh, and so on. All of these architectural treaties are uh, uh, comments, uh, validated comments on an, of the, the, the Bible of uh, Vitruvius, uh, which is the reference, uh, and this can be summarized through this triangle you see on this picture here. You have the triad of uh, Vitrus, Venustas, beauty, utilitas, um, the, the uh, order, and firmitas, uh, uh, um, uh, solidity, robustness. So, uh, um, Architecture uh, relies on this uh, uh, solid triangle, and any well-designed, well-constructed constructed project is is uh, fair, is right, because uh, it meets the demands of this uh, triangle: beauty, venusta, venustas, uh, utility, utilitas, and firmitas, uh, solidity, the solidity of construction. So here is an assumption that I'm putting forward um, in my presentation in the 18th century. There will be the, the, an event takes place over the course of several decades, what was called the Vitruvian tradition, uh, uh, architectural theory, will explode, uh, so to speak, will be taken apart, where uh, each part of this triangle will, conquer, will become autonomous. Venustas, uh, well, a number of events are quite symbolic of this uh, uh, dislocation, this breaking apart of the triangle. So beauty becomes uh, uh, almost an autonomous uh, science. The development of uh, romanticism and so on, in terms of utilitas, there is a rationalization of uh, construction plans with uh, Jacques-Nicolas Louis Durand, the first professor of architecture at the Polytechnic School when it was created by Bonaparte uh, in uh, 1789. And, uh, uh, through construction, uh, in construction, soliditas, this material, this matter, uh, will be the subject of a standalone science, which will be very different from the theory of proportions uh, or the issue of uh, utility. So, a number of events will shed light on this change, on these events and this explosion. I will not dwell on it, but for instance, the publication in 1758 of the text of uh, Julien David Leroy, an architect uh, who was uh, commissioned by the Academy of uh, Architecture to uh, control uh, uh, in Greece uh, the authenticity of the formula of beauty, so to speak, to examine uh, uh, on site the, uh, the theories of Vitruvius, Vitruvius. And he was surprised to see uh, that uh, uh, the contours, the proportions were not the same in Athens uh, compared to other cities. So these journeys were quite uh, useful. There's also Durand with a system of uh, a rational, rationalization of plans and a grid uh, shaping. Uh, there's also the construction of the church of Saint Geneviève by Soufflot. This is very interesting in terms of the knowledge of construction. So looking at this aspect of construction, stone uh, building, there are a number of symptoms terms, these are the illustrations that attest to it. I hope you can see them well. So there is the 
church, there, there are churches with isolated columns. There is a discussion around the status of the column as a component of architecture with a rationalistic uh, perspective. Uh, the column should be visible. It, it, we should know what it's for as, as a load-bearing uh, element. This is problematic in terms of construction, of course. It's, it is a, an, an interesting uh, discussion. There is a uh, discussion also on horizontal uh, arches. Uh, which establish uh, the space between the columns in the construction tradition in France, in particular for stone. The, the, the average size of the stone setting does not allow, as in ancient times, with, with monolithic blocks, to have a, a secured solidity, solidity by the very substance of the material. So there are a number of uh, um, solutions found to secure that. In terms of bridges, there are some fascinating experiments also. And looking at <coughs> a number of projects, the Church of Saint Geneviève, uh, which you can see on the screen. So uh, there are a number of problems which are being expressed. The this is paradoxical because this project of the church, saint Pierre Church, was a whim from Louis XV in the 1750s or perhaps a little earlier in 1744 and on the battlefield he uh, was, uh, he, he fell sick and he said, if I can survive this uh, disease, I will offer a magnificent, magnificent church to the people of Paris. So uh, uh, after recovering from his uh, uh, flu or, or whatever he had, he had to fulfill, he had to make this wish come true, this promise come true. And he set up a project to build a large church, a large monument for uh, Saint Geneviève. So this figure is at the crossroads of uh, various cultures. At the time, you had a, a rediscovery between the lines uh, of uh, a Gothic architecture which had been considered as disproportionate, barbaric, uh, in various architectural treaties, uh, the Gothics could, didn't know how to build. That's what was said at the time. Uh, they had to use uh, stone scaffoldings to, to make sure that the building was secured, that, they could, that it could stand. So these were all the theories addressed in the 18th centuries. So uh, with Soufflot, uh, by building this church, he brought together under one of the most beautiful forms the lightness of construction of Gothic uh, buildings with the magnificence of Greek architecture, ancient architecture. So he had to, to make this this uh, ideal synthesis, create this ideal mix through this church. On the illustration, you see the pillars, the, the load-bearing structures uh, are reduced to a minimum, to their minimum compared to churches with uh, isolated columns. Uh, if you look at the, the image on the right of the screen, you see the, the dome, uh, which is heavy, uh, 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 weighing on a system of colonnades, uh, which seems quite uh, uh, frail and transparent. So uh, this project by Soufflot is quite interesting. It raised a number of 
the most controversies. The uh, whistleblowers of the time, Pierre Pat, an architect uh, who was a collaborator of Blondel, Blondel published a memoir, not the one you can see on the screen, but uh, a text which warned about the risks of a collapse, of the collapse of the dome uh, with such a plan, such an architectural plan. So a number of uh, artificial uh, structures are developed, uh, uh, the reinforced uh, stone, uh, which was used for the colonnade of Perrault. It, it is uh, used again here in order to to find a solution uh, to this paradox of having the, the finesse of Gothic architecture in simple terms with the magnificence, the beauty uh, and, uh, and the appearance, uh, the, 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 the beautiful proportions of Greek architecture. So among those, you have these uh, uh, structures, this framework. And this is not the origin of reinforced concrete, but it is uh, system uh, uh, of uh, cast iron uh, um, devices for the architect uh, to have these beautiful uh, 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 proportions with a stone setting structure uh, which is uh, used by the world of production, the, use, the world of stone masons. So this Saint Geneviève uh, Church uh, started in uh, uh, the 17, late 1700s. It uh, ended in the 17, uh, in 1791. There were a number of issues uh, with the fortifications during the French Revolution. It was decided to change the, the program to tr transform this church into a cenotaph, into a pantheon, which involved a number of modifications uh, in terms of uh, the design of the works. In 1796, while the, the crown or the, this dome uh, 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 was set on top of the building, there was uh, a, a number of structural issues, especially uh, north of the, the, the cross of the nave. It was very specific, very precise. A night of um, March 1796, there were cracks and noises, worrying noises. So at the time, of course, the minister uh, of the interior, Benezek, uh, during the directoire, was very much concerned, as uh, all of his collaborators, they decide to uh, um, appoint two uh, external commissions or committees to understand the problem. Uh, uh, as if uh, uh, Pierre Pat's uh, warnings were coming true, were becoming true. So the first committee made of architects will establish a, a, a report and uh, uh, say in its expertise it's normal. Uh, 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 there's a problem of thickness of material with such a load. You need to reinforce uh, uh, those uh, uh, stacks, those columns, uh, which are too vulnerable, fragile. So the next committee, made of engineers, offers another uh, uh, interpretation which is radically different. No, it's not the problem of uh, thinness, thinness of columns. It's uh, an issue with the organization of the, the system of, of strength, the pathway of the strength. So they are um, offering to add buttresses to the structure. So there you go, poor minister in the pickle, two different expertise reports. So he appoint a third commission with mathematicians. And mathematicians looked at all this and said, okay, we're very happy, we're involved in all this. 
but we don't know exactly what to do. So they suggest, with good common sense, they said, OK, let's talk to the Masons. They're the ones who built this, so let's ask them questions about how they built it. So they took um, samples from the, the walls to, to see how they were built. And on this graph, to the left of the picture, you, you, you can see something very interesting, because these are the surveys of the samples taken uh, in situ, showing that there are obvious defects in the stone cutting uh, process. So that was a tradition with Parisian masons. They had a tradition to, you know, when you have two perfectly uh, cut blocks that are perfectly flat on one side but are rough on the others, they place um, wooden blocking parts to have a good compaction uh, over the entire work. So, why am I telling you this story? Well, because it's all, it's, it's all a matter of cement, of mortar, and of construction defect that led to this concern and to this uh, uh, radical way to revisit the way uh, these large stone buildings were being built. After Soufflo died in 17 whatever, 1780, I think, the site is managed by Jean-Baptiste Rondelet. Jean-Baptiste Rondelet is a well-versed architect who knows everything about the, the theories of construction. And, interestingly enough, when he started working on the church, Rondelet conducted experiments. And he mostly started working on material resistance. You have uh, excerpts from his uh, uh, book called The Art of Building, and you have the drawing of this machine he uses to assess the compression forces exerted on the stones. So here you see that it's a link between materials and new tests to ensure, not in the great tradition of uh, guilds and uh, building traditions, but to build according to rules. And there is one word that emerges at that time, which is quite interesting, they're no longer talking about robustness, and they're talking about stability. So there is a new understanding of what a building is that changes the whole relationship to that. And, of course, all this translates into, let's call it a style, a style that's going to change the very vision in the type of building that are being designed. I showed these, Im I showed these images because they're a good illustration of these new trends where you have what we call neoclassicism, the type of architecture which has deployed uh, during the French Revolution and at the beginning of uh, the uh, next century. This style opposes the Barocco tradition and it highlights uh, the uh, geometric, geometrical solids, uh, simple facades, etc., etc. So in architecture, uh, architecture is a reflection of the work conducted on material resistance and, and materials and building stability. Now, there is one paper that's going to totally 
transform the knowledge we have about producing uh, lime and mortars. We all know the name of Louis-Joseph Vica, the man who discovered cement and who is a pioneer in cement making. He was a young engineer in 1810. He was sent on an internship to work on a, build, a, a bridge that was being built, the Suyak Bridge in Dordogne. So it was an internship, and back in the days, internships were not lasting six months, but they were lasting six years. And he had nothing to do because, uh, well, the build, the bridge was being built, but these were still the Napoleonic Wars, so there was no much money to, to, to build the bridge. So he had uh, days in which he had nothing else to do but testing uh, limestone that he burnt at different temperatures to which he added uh, some adjuvants, uh, silica, sand, etc. And he reported this in a beautiful table which I'm showing to you on this slide. And in 1880, when he published this beautiful paper in the uh, journal of chemistry entitled Research, Experimental Research on Construction, Limestone, Concretes and Ordinary Mortars. The article includes more than a hundred of such tables showing the relationship to knowledge people had back in the days. They tested, compared, etc. And that's a perfect representation of the transformation in the field of acquiring knowledge that uh, took place, not just in the field of construction, it also uh, occurred in the field of physics, mathematics, natural sciences, biology, etc., etc. So, let's come back to concrete. We are in, at the beginning of the uh, 1820s, and the production of cement and concrete started developing. What were cement and concrete back in the days? Well, they were supposed to be invisible materials. And for uh, an architect, concrete does not exist. But in civil engineering and in large works in a developing Europe, concrete is used for the enlargement of harbors. They had a system to, to, to produce large blocks of artificial stone, which they then threw at sea. And this is why in cities like Marseille, Toulon, uh, or even Algiers, after the French invasion or conquest of the country, an architect was commissioned to create a harbor, and he organized a huge works to build um, jetties and, and, and pontoons, etc. In cement, we have a similar uh, work, and the Suez Canal is a very interesting example of that. In 1860, the Suez Canal was a huge uh, site, and it's the cement manufacturing that uh, was awarded the contract. Uh, it was, uh, and it's such a huge project that propelled the company in very high spheres. So all this to say what? Well, just to say that concrete is something you're not supposed to see. Whereas in in these days, stones remain the major the, the main construction materials, whether for urban renovations, uh, city constructions, etc., etc. So stone doesn't have the same status as this new material which is supposed to replace stone, i.e. concrete. You have this beautiful picture by Levi Levost here. It's entitled uh, 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 
was uh, sent from Rome, and it shows the difference between these heavy, uh, shapeless stones and then you have this beautiful architecture and stone architecture as we understand it through the drawings we have and through research that was carried out like in this uh, a graph by Auguste Choisy that shows how we understand this type of architecture. It's uh, very analytical. We try and understand how it goes. There are many debates in France, in Germany, with regards to the origin of Greek temples. Were they originally made of wood? Or were they made of stone right from the outset? All these debates are hot topics with academia and architects back in the days. Another example, which is quite characteri characteristic of the implementation of stone in construction in the uh, 19th century, we talked about Violet le Duc earlier. He is the one who best understood uh, uh, Gothic uh, construction theories. And I have these two pictures here. Uh, Cuvier and Violet Le Duc. Cuvier is a botanist. He's not a predecessor of Darwin, not exactly, because C Cuvier is not, does not belong to the same school of thought. But he believed that from a vertebra you can redraw the entire skeleton of an animal. And for Violet Le Duc, it's exactly the same thing. He believes that from a very small part or element of architecture, you can um, redevelop the entire rationale behind the, the construction. OK, I'm going faster because uh, we could talk about the style issues here where stone and eclecticism will replace the dislocated theory of the previous century. But let's take a look at these two buildings, which are more than famous, obviously. The Eiffel Tower, 1889, as we all know. It was erected on foundations which use as many tons of concrete as the uh, weight of the metal that was used to build the Eiffel Tower. The opera is laid on foundations of concrete of several thousand tons. So, concrete is there. It's a support for architecture and for the major constructions which are built by t back in the days, but it, it remains invisible. And the problem is exactly that. Concrete has no pedigree, no visual identity. It does not exist. And one invention, or shall we call it discovery, in the second half of the 19th century is going to totally change the system. This is when the uh, reinforced concrete was uh, invented. So that's the boat a lodge uh, guard who was fed up seeing his boat being rotten in the, in the pond. So his name was Louis-Joseph uh, Lombeau, and he decided to use cement to line his boat. A few years later, Mr. Meunier, a gardener, find a patent for a system of um, flower boxes also made of uh, uh, reinforced cement. And in the years after, after that, there is a proliferation of inventions using reinforced cement or concrete. I started working on the history of, con of reinforced concrete, and when I started working on reinforced concrete, I spent a few days at the National Institutes of Intellectual Property, and before 1905, 
which is a very important date in the in the history of reinforced uh, concrete, I found uh, of more than almost 2,000 patents filed on the use of reinforced concrete. So it shows you that reinforced concrete was one way that allowed concrete to really emerge from underneath the soil. Uh, here is a pattern by Ennebic, uh, an expert in, in uh, reinforced concrete, and he invented sort of bracket. Très facile et très peu cher à produire. I have uh, les chantiers, a bracket, which is a perfect mécanique dans la mesure où example of tools used back in the days. I had it in Barcelona, and when I went through the customs, they uh, stole my my bracket because it's a weapon of mass destruction. Apparently, it's a metal. It's 20 centimeters high. There you go. But the bracket is what made the fortune of this um, person. He used this very smart trick. It's a money-saving trick. It's very cheap to produce. And it has a mechanical efficacy because it compensates for uh, efforts we can't in, in, in friction and tension. So he has this invention that he developed in and implemented in the various in various uh, work sites. So his true work is in the way he promoted his system. First, he doesn't use the system himself. He creates a, a franchise system and gives licenses to other entrepreneurs to use his system. And his approach is a win-win approach. So for 15% of the sales of the uh, company using his system, he provides uh, the uh, blueprints, and also he promotes the companies that are going to work for this system. And this is why he encourages companies, an increasingly larger number of companies working with his uh, system, to take pictures of the buildings they built. Why? Because Ennebic is very much present in all trade shows um, revolving around construction. And then he created a magazine called, come on, obvious, concrete, um, uh, reinforced concrete. And in this magazine, he shows pictures to advertise for his um, for the material and for his uh, technology. And he asked all his uh, franchisees to take pictures of uh, their works. And back in the days, you have to understand that, well, we're talking about 1900, and back in the days, reinforced concrete and photography are brand new things. Photography, that's not a smartphone phone. Uh, it, these are shops established in cities or villages, like, like you have a butcher's shop or a shoe shop, you have a, a photographer's shop, and the photographer had to be both an artist and a chemist, and he was being called upon by the various entrepreneurs to take pictures of their works, and sometimes it's a bit of a problem, but there are masterpieces which are quite extraordinary when you look at them. Look at these silos. And here, look, you have a picture. The, just imagine, the entrepreneur is asked to build a reservoir, a big water holding basin in concrete. And he says, okay, we need to take a picture. So we'll make a picture. We'll ask the photographer to come and take a picture. And look at what the photographer has to show. 
Well, this is it. No visual identity. It's grey, it's dirty. So what does the photographer do? So, uh, I, I studied the history of photographers of these days. And very often these photographers studied in fine art schools and they compose the picture. And here, in terms of art history interpretation, you have three levels. You have the material, I mean, the cement, the concrete, the formal level, and then the more spiritual or industrial level, if you'd like. It, and if you talk about Aristotle, you have uh, the... Uh, material, formal, and final cause. We're not talking about philosophy here, but behind every picture there is something very powerful at play. And the number of photographies which have been taken offers a wonderful and extraordinary overview. And all these pictures have been published. And I pay a pretty penny to have a beautiful printing a large-scale print of this. I mean, modernity it stands here. This picture reminds me of the work of a photographer whose name was Jeff Wall. He was organizing a scene as if they were taking it 125th of a second. And he, he sets characters and it's exactly the same thing here you have here the very famous picture of workers having a picnic on the metal beam of a skyscraper being uh, built well that was commissioned that was an ad campaign and it's exactly the same thing here with concrete you have these pictures you have this reservoir in 1902 and there is nothing but that. And there is a subliminal expressive power here that's being expressed through these photographies, which is absolutely extraordinary. And most of these photographies are unknown and anonymous. But FYI, the archives of modern architecture keep uh, almost 10,000 such pictures. It's a gold mine in terms of photography heritage, which is absolutely extraordinary. Look at this geometry, this, this amazing perspective with this small character here. Uh, you have uh, this splendid work here. This is a building of a flooring in, Jean, in Genoa. This picture, which is very interesting to me, I'll tell you why. The photo this is in Egypt. Uh, the photographer has to uh, take pictures of a work site, which is not very exciting, but uh, this image is very powerful. There are two registers here, the sand, the earth, first of all, and the sky, the air. And in the juxtaposition, juxtaposition there's, uh, uh, there are two worlds, the material and the, in, the tangible and the intangible world. Uh, these uh, pictures are very telling. Here we see geometry, strict geometry uh, with the structure, the building itself, uh, in an industrial building, and uh, the uh, dirt and the ugliness of concrete, reinforced concrete, and uh, this will give, uh, uh, will lend it uh, its visual aspect, um, the visual aspect of reinforced concrete, which didn't really have a pedigree. So the picture on the right, you have the Theatre of Bern, which has been built in 1903. So you just see the main uh, uh, frame here with, uh, before the girding and the velvet and the, and the uh, light structures. The photographer really understood what was at stake here. You see the play of light, uh, the alignment, uh, the contre-jour. 
And uh, next to it, you have a picture by Charles de Vailly. The inside of the Church of Saint Genevieve is the same language on this drawing here. This is a, 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 a pencil draw, drawing. You see a sort of epiphany, the light coming through uh, that building through the vaults and columns uh, which constitute the frame. And you, if you look at the theater of Bern on the right side, uh, uh, you have the light uh, which comes through uh, the work, the building. So each picture can be analyzed in this manner. In 1920 now, you see L'Esprit Nouveau, the, the new spirit. Uh, we talked about Le Corbusier. Uh, um, um, here we have uh, Charles, uh, Charles Edouard Jean Jeanneret, the, uh, Le Corbusier, with his mentor, uh, Ahmed aux Enfants, a painter. They found, uh, they created this uh, journal, L'Esprit Nouveau. It's after World War I. In many European countries, there are many things happening. There's a sort of new wave, spiritual wave. Uh, 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 artists uh, uh, um, want to build a new society. In this journal, you have contributions by different authors, and one text uh, is uh, called uh, Three Reminders to uh, the Architects uh, before being uh, printed. Uh, uh, they, they said we need a text on architecture. You've uh, worked with um, uh, um, architects. Uh, can you write something on architecture? So this text called Three Reminders to the Architects, uh, written uh, under pen name Le Corbusier. And this text will uh, become uh, uh, famous instantly. Architects will, will really uh, uh, rethink their position, uh, and uh, here he promotes uh, concrete and reinforced cement. It's uh, the birth of modern architecture in a way, in a caricature, caricatural way uh, through this text. So you see the this visual production of industrial equipment, the use, the use of reinforced cement, which uh, became uh, prevalent in architecture from then on. So concrete became visible suddenly through publications, journals. So there's a new status uh, uh, given to concrete. And again, this is what I like to call the visuality of concrete. You see it, you recognize it as a material, and it will uh, not fill uh, um, bookshelves, but it will soon become, uh, uh, even though it's not very prevalent before uh, World War II, but it will be a new material for a new architecture, a new potential. So of course we need to talk about uh, um, time flies, but uh, among the numerous architects which will, who will enhance the, the value of this material, we have to talk about Auguste Perret, a very interesting figure. Uh, he, he is quite interesting, I mean. So this figure is known as being one of the first concrete uh, builders, reinforced concrete builders. So he has a sort of dual identity. He is the son uh, and brother of entrepreneurs, uh, someone who builds uh, with concrete, with concrete, and who has made some of uh, the industrial buildings I've referred to earlier. And it's all, also someone who went to a fine arts school. So you see a beautiful drawing, which is very typical of the pupils, uh, the students of the of, uh, fine arts schools. So Auguste Perret has a foot in concrete and a foot in stone. Uh, I'm not sure it makes it ma this metaphor makes sense, but it's a hybrid 
image which justifies the interest we might have on uh, his uh, achievements, his creations. Here uh, you have the uh, Conseil économique et social in Paris, uh, which was the Museum of Public Works, uh, of Civil Engineering Works, uh, made by Auguste Perret in 1937. In this type of architecture, you have the fine arts uh, tradition, the columns, uh, the foundations, the capitals. So it's a language which is inherited uh, from stone uh, building, but interpreted uh, through the use uh, and, uh, and the mastery of uh, Auguste Perret, that Auguste Perret has of, of cement and concrete. Here, look at the capitals, uh, you, he invents tools to make uh, uh, these uh, structures smooth, you have grooves uh, in the stone, in the cornices, the, the system of lintels, so the, the formal register is very much inherited from a, a stone building, while uh, uh, substantially uh, um, focusing on a reinforced concrete. So, before concluding, a few illustrations. What happened uh, at the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, this relationship between stone and concrete, is it a hate relationship? We're not quite sure. We saw it with Adolf Loos, or is it a love affair? Uh, or uh, we, we don't really know, love or hate. But uh, uh, let me speak of a few experiments which are quite symbolic of this relationship, which is very much ambiguous in terms of the materiality of the stone and the new materiality of concrete and reinforced concrete. At the end of the 19th century, a patent was filed by uh, Vika, the, the company, the cement manufacturer, Vicar, the son, and now it's the family. It's a dynasty uh, 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 working around uh, making cement in the region of Isère, uh, where you have the city of Grenoble. So this uh, patent was filed on the a quick setting uh, cement, which allows you to do molded cement, which was quite successful in, in the 18th century. In the 19th century, uh, uh, I mean. À Grenoble. Here you see on these pictures, uh, bottom left, uh, this is not stone, it's artificial stone, it is concrete. You have a specific machine that uh, makes artificial stone, a molded stone. Uh, and you should read the work of a colleague, which is very interesting, uh, called, bear with me. Um, uh, it will come back to me. Never you mind. It's a very good, he's a very good friend, and I forgot his name. Imagine. In Grenoble, uh, on the picture, the right uh, picture. Ah, this is annoying, forgetting his name. So you have a very beautiful building. It's called the Elephant Building. It's molded uh, stone, and it really feels like you're looking at a stone building. But these elements were exported in Tur Turin uh, and in Milan. Uh, imagine the city of Milan, you are in front of the Piazza del Duomo, and on the left you have the Victor Emanuele Gallery with its uh, beautiful uh, glass uh, 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 structures. And all of these buildings that are sculpted are in molded uh, cement, and people don't know about that. Ah, Cédric Avenier, that's my friend's name, write it down, it came back to me. An architect, historian, who worked very much uh, on, this, uh, uh, on these uh, buildings and this subject. So in Grenoble, you have the Church of Saint Bruno, neo-Gothic style, uh, um, it's, and it's molded uh, cement again. Another project on the right, the picture on the right, it's more, um, it's an older uh, church, uh, Église Sainte-Marguerite in Le Vésiné, 
uh, built by Coignet and Boileau in 1855. So this church uh, had uh, an unfortunate uh, fate. The construction system was imposed by the promoter uh, of, of uh, um, all the construction done in Le Visené, Alphonse uh, Le Palu, uh, a friend of uh, François Coignet, Coignet, and he had uh, just uh, filed a patent on agglomerated um, concrete. The architect said, OK, but he didn't want to hear about concrete. And you see the detail here on the right. You see the, the uh, appearance of a stone construction, uh, but the concrete at the time was not very well controlled. And uh, uh, stains came up. You had shadows, which were quite ugly, on the surface uh, of the church, uh, which uh, discredited, in part, the invention of Coignet, which was a, a great uh, invention, nevertheless. So uh, Le Corbusier talked about these uh, houses, specific houses with a, a particular process which is the Thomas Edison uh, uh, method. Uh, obviously, Thomas Edison is famous for, the, for inventing the phone and the electric telegraph and other inventions. Uh, he was an inventor, and among these inventions, he filed a patent on uh, the construction of a house in liquid cement. You have a small city in the States, the United States, uh, called Cement City, <laughs> uh, uh, which is uh, built with this uh, liquid cement system uh, invented by Thomas Edison. So you see pictures of that uh, method here. If you go to uh, Prague to see the beautiful Baroque architecture, well, there's a small uh, neighborhood, the Cubist neighborhood, uh, where you have of architects like Joseph Chauchol designing these cubist uh, houses, dwellings, using this uh, uh, system, of, uh, system of molded concrete. So we have many examples of this uh, with these illustrations and pictures. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about this. A, a problem of uh, visual identity. So you have an artificial stone, a liquid stone. You have constructions in concrete that we've seen imitating stone. So something is not clear here. It's quite hybrid in terms of uh, uh, its visual aspect. But you have here very interesting examples. The stairs of the palace of the people or the house of the people uh, uh, built by Victor Horta. Unfortunately, a monument which was uh, demolished in the 1960s, but Horta was known for being very rigorous, uh, very precise. Uh, for one stone cutting, there are 50 sketches, uh, uh, um, an infinite number of requirements. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sculpture that is very refined. Then you have Art Nouveau, uh, uh, this uh, incredible style, uh, stylistic uh, um, property. This is uh, then a picture I took a week ago to illustrate uh, this uh, conference on the right. You have uh, the Casa Batlo by Gaudi on the Paseo di Gracia. You may know of this uh, 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 construction, which is a true masterwork by Gaudi. There's also the, the church, the, the famous church by Gaudi, of course. Uh, there's, a, there's a controversy on this uh, uh, famous uh, uh, Familia Sagrada, Sagrada Familia. And some people are saying we should have stopped when Gaudi uh, died. Maybe we, we're doing too much with this uh, uh, building, with this church. So these are stone buildings made in stone. Uh, 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 you see that the stone is sort of liquefied here. In Barcelona, there's also a building with its columns. And, and this architecture is sort of looking uh, 
for a specific language. And I enjoy that the unpredictable aspect of this type of architecture. We don't know what language to, to use. And uh, in talking about the built world, there are many things we could uh, talk about. I like this relationship. Uh, uh, here you can recognize on the left a detail from the falling water of Frank Lloyd Wright, where you see the stone and concrete, stone and concrete resonating in their own uh, register. Uh, you have the massive uh, column and the stack of the stone and, and the different concrete elements brought together, which makes me think of these counter-constructions of uh, Theo van Dersburg in uh, neoplasticism. This language, uh, uh, here you have uh, uh, co coincidences which are quite uh, uh, telling in this um, new architecture uh, with the use of this material. A project I, I like very much here, an architect which became famous three to four years ago because he was awarded the, the Pritzker Prize, uh, Alejandro Aravena from Chile. On the left, you have uh, three stones, three blocks of stone uh, uh, super, that are superimposed. So here, this is an allegory, a metaphor, uh, in a way, which shows uh, that, uh, which really shows the use of concrete and reinforced concrete. So here you have a flurry of examples. Uh, 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 there are many other examples, of course. Uh, this shows the use of stone in contemporary architecture. Um, the pavilion of Miss Van der Rohe, which is a masterpiece uh, in, in Barcelona. The use of space and the materials. And it's a uh, uh, tribute to marble, to onyx, to travertine. Uh, Peter Zuntor uses uh, stone in a very interesting manner in his bath. Uh, you, you have the, the stones being stacked. Uh, uh, there's Peronin for a recent project. Uh, De Meuron, uh, uh, a very uh, interesting dwelling. Porzon Park, uh, this is more ambiguous here. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's another type of stone, a staple stone. And he says, because uh, in France we don't really know how to use this material, so I use it in a different manner. So <laughs> it's a sort of catch-22 in the discourse, but uh, uh, never mind. So many different interesting examples. And to conclude, uh, a quote, as I promised you at the beginning of my speech, Tadao Ando, uh, concrete is the marble of the 20th century. Thank you very much for your attention. Donc on continue et euh, on termine With the last euh, avec une dernière lecture euh, qu'on va entendre sur euh, une lecture en fait avec Auguste, euh, Auguste Perret. Perret. It's a beauty, Auguste Perret. It's a beautiful transition now, uh, after your presentation, Mr. Simonet. And there are some aphorisms that are very interesting. It's the first edition in 1952 of contribution to a theory of architecture. So over to Lola and Baptiste for this uh, reading. Thank you. La construction est la langue maternelle de l'architecte. L'architecte est un poète qui pense et parle en construction. Technique, permanent hommage rendu à la nature, essentiel aliment de l'imagination, authentique source d'inspiration. Prière de toute la plus efficace langue maternelle de tout créateur. Technique, parler en poète nous conduit en architecture. L'édifice, c'est la charpente munie des éléments et des formes imposées par les conditions permanentes qui, le soumettant à la nature, le rattachent au passé et lui confèrent la durée. À l'origine, il n'est d'architecture que de charpente en bois. Pour éviter le feu, on construit en dur. Et le prestige de la charpente en bois est tel qu'on en reproduit tous les traits jusqu'aux têtes de cheville. À partir de ce moment, l'architecture dite classique n'est plus qu'un décor. Entre-temps s'élève sur le sol de France le roman, 
puis l'ogivale, nervure et arc boutant, véritable charpente de pierre qui couvre l'Europe. Enfin, voici la charpente d'acier. Puis, née en France, la charpente en béton de ciment armé, prête à couvrir le monde d'une authentique architecture. Les grands édifices d'aujourd'hui comportent une ossature, une charpente en acier ou en béton de ciment armé. L'ossature est à l'édifice ce que le squelette est à l'animal. De même que le squelette de l'animal, rythmé, équilibré, symétrique, contient et supporte les organes les plus divers et les plus diversement placés, de même, la charpente de, l'évis... de, l'é... Pardon. La charpente de l'édifice doit être composée, rythmée, équilibrée, symétrique même. Elle doit pouvoir contenir les organes, les organismes les plus divers et les plus diversement placés, exigés par la fonction. Et la destination. Celui qui dissimule une partie quelconque de la charpente se prive du seul légitime et plus bel ornement de l'architecture. Celui qui dissimule un poteau commet une faute. Celui qui fait un faux poteau commet un crime. Les conditions passagères et les conditions permanentes satisfaites, l'édifice ainsi soumis à l'homme et à la nature aura du caractère. Il aura du style, il sera harmonieux. Caractère, style, harmonie, jalonne le chemin qui, par la vérité, conduit à la beauté. C'est par la splendeur du vrai que l'édifice atteint à la beauté. Le vrai est dans tout ce qui a l'honneur et la peine de porter ou de protéger. Ce vrai, c'est la proportion qui le fera resplendir. Et la proportion, c'est l'homme même. Celui qui, sans trahir les matériaux ni les programmes modernes, aurait produit une œuvre qui semblerait avoir toujours existé, qui, en un mot, serait banale. Je dis que celui-là pourrait pourrait se tenir tenir pour satisfait. Well, thank you very much again, and I'll be looking forward to meet you again for our third session of this conference at Pavillon de l'Arsenal. Thank you.